Okay, uh, so dear colleagues, welcome you to Translation Summer School Winter Edition webinar, the second webinar on audiovisual translation, uh, together with Professor Jorge Diaz Sintas. As you remember, today's event is most useful for those who plan to develop a course of audiovisual translation, yet we are sure that uh, it will be as useful for non-academicians as well. Uh, as we promised, today's event presupposes more interaction with the audience. So, as I already mentioned before, we are using Zoom meeting, but not uh, the webinar as we did it yesterday. Yet, we kindly ask you to mute yourself uh, uh, and uh, possibly show us your video. Um, so, now I give the floor to Professor Jorge Diaz Sintas. Jorge, you are welcome. The floor is there. Okay, thank you again, Alexander. And it's nice to be able to see uh, some of you. Yesterday was a little bit just talking to myself. I'm not sure what this pandemic is going to do to our mental health. Just looking at the screen and talking as if I was a bit mad. Um, but now seeing you makes it a little bit different and I can see reactions and, and it's a different way of communi communicating here. Uh, I can see that some of you have already contributed to the chat saying that you have already entered the platform and you've been playing with it and you find it easy, which uh, is music to my ears. I'm, I'm very pleased that you like it and then you can lose the fear uh, to, to, to use this technology. I know at the beginning, if you, are, if you are a trainer of translation, but you've never done subtitling, it can be a little bit daunting, a little bit challenging. Um, and you always think that students are going to know more than you and you are probably right um, because they're all native uh, um, uh, digital natives uh, whereas some of us I certainly are um, a digital immigrant so I came to the digital world far too late and but I, I always make it clear to my students that you know this is not a one-way um, road that we're all learning from each other there are many programs there are many things that some people know more or less and it usually works well with the students that they take uh, the initiative and they produce things in a way that is helpful for other people. I ask them as well to create easy guides themselves so that they can share with other colleagues and so on. So we are learning. And um, I'm, I, I think it's a fear that we have to lose. They say, okay, fine, I don't know much, but I want to, to teach you this and I want to learn with you and let's make the most of it. And, and it usually works well, you know, and you wouldn't be the first ones. I've, I've trained many people in many parts of the world, in China, uh, St. Petersburg, in, in Latin America, in Europe. And it's always the same fear sometimes that people think, oh, it's too late for me to be teaching this. And I'm not really sure how I'm gonna be dealing with the technology. There are ways that you can do away with the technology and then pass that on to the students if that is something that you fear. But there is a lot more than just technology. It is subtitling is very techy, uh, but it is a lot more than that. And, and I will give you ideas on, on, on what strategies and what sort of exercises and, and things like that you could um, use. I'm going to start sharing now. Uh, because I've got quite a bit of material uh, to be sharing with you today. And um, feel free if you want to uh, contact me later. I know I cannot address uh, everybody's, in, um, uh, everybody's um, interests in here. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a short, uh, two short seminars, but you do have my email account. And if there is anything in particular that you want to know, feel free to send me an email. I usually, I always respond, not usually, I always respond. Um, it might take me a little bit if I am a bit busy, but I will reply. And the email account is correct. It's not, it hasn't got an extra Z or something in the middle so that, you know, it, it doesn't reach me. It does, and I will reply. Um, so what I have done, um, I've taken into consideration your uh, queries yesterday, and um, I've created a list, a list of bibliographical references that I will be sending again to Alexander and Lesia so that it can be distributed later on. And um, uh, I'll show you here, I'm gonna put this here, it helps better if I move it there. So this is, I've created something uh, very uh, simple here which is to be shared today, which is the bibliography. You will see here, I didn't want to make it too, too much. So I've given you something, audiovisual translation in general. You've got audio description, somebody was asking, on dubbing, re-speaking, and they all have hyperlinks where you can reach the material there. Uh, they are single authored books, most of them, so that you've got a, a, a whole overview 
of, of a particular practice. So that I will be sending. And, um, and then let's start with uh, yesterday, we saw mostly everything that it has to do with subtitling, but there were two little things that I wanted to just um, make sure that you're aware of um, when you come to this part of the PowerPoint. When we do subtitles, there is one theory and, and one idea that if the images are changing, on the screen, we don't want to leave a subtitle hanging or, or on the screen across the images. So the idea is that we'll, we want the subtitle to leave before the images have changed or to start a new subtitle after the new images come on the screen. That's the idea. It's not always feasible. You will see lots of TV series and, and films when they do more dynamic montage and then they're talking without the uh, camera changing and then it changes and you can hear people across. So it's not always uh, possible, but you will see if you check, for instance, Netflix guidelines, that they are very, very finicky on how to deal with short changes. So ideally, we want my subtitle to leave before the short change and come in after uh, the short change if there's a new one. And that is why virtually all programs, subtitling programs, will scan the video and tell us exactly where there is a short change. So in here, I can see, uh, let me see. I can see here that there is a short change right there. There is another one there. There is another one here. And there is another one here. And the cameras, the subtitling program is going to know. And it's going to tell you if you go across, it's going to tell you you're doing something wrong in here. So this is one of the uh, technical dimensions that we have to bear in mind when doing subtitling. And then you will see as well uh, in here, you've got this sentence that I've come up with that you probably cannot read very well because I've done something silly, which is break one of the simple rules in most languages, which is um, I don't leave a space, a blank space between words. Yeah, and that makes it difficult to read. I can read it, but it's difficult. Now, this concept, this gap between subtitles so that they can be read, it is something that I need to do as well in subtitling. Yeah, I need to leave a pause between uh, subtitles when they come one next to each other. The idea, and I'll try to explain it graphically, in here, imagine this is a film and these are the many frames that you've got. You've got a subtitle that finishes here, but they are talking all the time. Yeah? So this subtitle finishes here and I need to leave at least two frames between these two subtitles, two frames that are going to be blank. Nothing is written. So when this one finishes, I have to leave the uh, video to move two frames only, nothing in here as if it was a pause between the two words, and then the next subtitle starts. Then when I finish this subtitle, then I will need to leave two frames blank and then the new one. So the eye will see very fractionally that is text no text, text again, yeah, and then you can follow. Otherwise, if the subtitles were similar, you wouldn't notice that they've changed. You think that it's probably the old one going in there. And this is what we call gap between subtitles. Netflix will also ask you, do two. Some companies prefer four. Yeah, but this is something that they tell you. But it is always, the minimum is always two that you should leave. Yeah, so that is the technical dimension that I wanted to mention that yesterday I didn't do. And then you already have this PowerPoint. You can see the golden rules that I came up with. So just to remind you, the subtitles, try to make them semantically self-contained. If you could have one idea in one subtitle, do it that way. Don't leave ideas hanging over subtitles because, it, because then it's more complicated to understand and to follow. Yeah, so when possible, self-contained. We'll see that not, it's not always possible because the people speak with long sentences and so on. But if you can, always think about that. Always consider the line breaks. So when you go from one line to the next, wonder why you're doing that and make it easy to read. And I'll show you 
some examples and exercises that you could do with your ex with your students. Punctuation always. We don't have much punctuation in subtitling, so it has to be really consistent. And I will show you um, towards the end of this session today some um, uh, tests. Uh, many companies will have tests to uh, incorporate to onboard, as they call, uh, new subtitlers. And I will show you a couple of tests of what they are expecting from newcomers. So that, again, you can replicate some of those exercises in your classroom so that students know when they are exposed to those in, in, in subsequent tests. If you are working with, the, with a language that is similar, or you think that your audience will understand, try to follow the original. Because usually people are listening and reading at the same time. So if they hear uh, Shakespeare uh, was born in a small city in England called Stratford-upon-Avon, you don't translate Stratford-upon-Avon is a small city in Britain where Shakespeare was worked was born because you hear Shakespeare and then you read Stratford upon Avon. So I'm, I'm hearing things and I'm reading something completely different. Now, if you translate from Chinese or uh, Spanish or a language that people won't understand in your language, then you are more flexible when how you play with your text. But if you know most of the complaints sometimes by uh, the audience is that the original doesn't seem too much and then that people are deleting too much information. You know, they can hear things that they cannot see written. And, and then again, you don't need to do a pyramid with your subtitles. Usually people traditionally say, oh, do a pyramid so that the top line is shorter and the bottom line is longer. And then you don't get pollution. You don't pollute the images as much. Uh, if you do it the other way around, the long line is on the top, then you're going to be uh, polluting. You're going to be contaminating the images. But I would always recommend, and I think most companies have come now to understand that it's better that the syntax is easy to follow even if then this, the lines is the top line is longer than the bottom one. Okay, so always follow the syntax and break your lines when you think it makes sense grammatically speaking. And technically, I told you this is something that is done for many years. The maximum time that a subtitle should stay on the screen is six seconds. Sometimes, and Netflix will tell you seven because music, songs, can be very slow in the way they are presented and then your subtitles might stay might need to be left on the screen a bit longer and then the minimum so that people have time to read it even if it's a yes only then it will have to be uh one second netflix will go down to 20 frames it's a slightly less than a second but no less than that otherwise the eye doesn't read it uh, the brain cannot read it and it appears and disappears like a flash and it's, it's, it's ugly and, and you feel frustrated because you cannot really read what he's saying so ideally one second yeah and sometimes it's a little a bit of a problem and then you've got here we we cover all this yesterday, uh, two frames between subtitles, two lines, and uh, 39 characters usually to do your translations, okay? Um, so that we saw, and this finishes what I wanted to show you um, the other day. Now, what I'm gonna show you is, I'm going to start uh, today's PowerPoint, and um, let me see, I'm moving things on here so that you can see it all. Um, so I promised to you uh, that I was going to show you some of the documents that are produced for translators. This is a document produced for uh, the film Manhattan Murder Mystery. And cinema uh, tends to come up with these very detailed dialogue lists. Um, they're called dialogue lists short, uh, although in the industry they are called combined continuity and dialogue list. And you can see that they are like uh, pre-production uh, di uh, scripts and they tell you all the information. Uh, Larry is speaking, but it's overlapping because if it's overlapping, uh, well, you can see here, this part here, that's what they produce for dubbing uh, translators, translators that are going to be working with the dubbed version of the film. So that means that if Larry is overlapping with Carol, then when you dub, the two dubbing actors will have to overlap as well. If, uh, they, if Larry is stuttering here, then the dubbing actor will have to stutter and your translation will have to somehow uh, reproduce the stuttering so that the uh, dubbing actor knows how it's done. So all this part here is for the dubbing actors and the dubbing translator. So here, you know, it's off camera, so you don't need to worry too much about lip syncing 
because you know that the lips are not going to be shown on the screen. Yeah, so that's why they go to these details so that you know what's going on in there. And then this part here, and then you will remember we, we told yesterday about a concept, spotting. Yeah, and the spotting here is somebody has decided to split the original dialogue and make it like subtitles for you to translate. So you don't need to worry on what to take away. Some people do worry because I think, well, I know, and I prefer to delete information that I think is not important rather than people telling me what I shouldn't translate. But you can see here, um, he says, hey, look, do do. I don't want to, you, you, you'll you wind up rooming with Gotti. And then what I got here is all this, hey, look, do do. I, you'll wind up rooming with John Gotti. You can do that. And it's much more standard. They've deleted all the hesitations. They deleted repl replications. And they're telling you, OK, ignore all that. Concentrate on the meaning, on the, on the denotative meaning uh, that is in here. But not only that, they are aware that John Gotti is going to be a problem for the translators. And then you get here, rooming, implying that you're going to be in prison. And John Gotti is a mafia crime boss that is now, at the time of the film, being held in prison. So you know all the information and then you will find here as well, open-minded, what does it mean? Judgmental, they give you information and they refer you to another subtitle in another part of the film that is also related to this one. So they can be very, very detailed. Uh, Netflix is working on this as well for subtitling for their platform to make sure that translator has as much information as they need so that they can speed up their process. I'm sure I can just Google for John Gotti and find it here and there. But if they already tell him, are telling me, then I'm gonna be much faster to just break up all those sorts of problems. Now, these are American films and they're really good. Europeans, we're not that good. You've got an example here from a Spanish film uh, called La Flor de Mi Secreto, translated The Flower of My Secret. And this is what they prepared for the uh, translators. Virtually nothing. I know some of you uh, understand Spanish. I'll have to be careful, particularly if Lesia is listening to me. Uh, but in here, you can see uh, some of the comments. And then you go here, ¿Qué estás hablando? And then you go a one. And then in here at the bottom of the screen, I've got one, que estas hablando is the same as, pero que dices, but what do you say? Yeah, it's very, very simple. Anybody, if you don't know that, you probably shouldn't be translating this film into any other language because that is very, very basic. The same as here, ha pasado, which is a footnote uh, number two, if I remember what it was uh, in here, uh, yeah. Pero eso ha pasado there. And then here they tell me ha pasado is ha pasado. And this is something that we do, we speak. We delete this, le this letter. So you can see, compared to the other one, which is very, very detailed, all the wealth of information, this one is very, very basic. And, and this is something that people in the industry have been calling, you know, if you want your films to be internationally uh, reputed and well translated, maybe you should take more care of the documentation that comes with the film and not just simply the film. And then somebody else, somebody asked as well, <coughs> can you show us or can you tell us what are the differences between uh, subtitles that are done for um, as uh, deaf people and, and so on. So in here, you've got, uh, I've got some examples. What, what do I need to do? For instance, I need to tell a deaf person who is speaking. And I can do that for using colors. So I assign them a color. Yellow is one person. Green is another person. And then once you're watching, you know who is yellow, blue, green, and then you can follow. I can also move the subtitles. So if I put this one here, is this guy speaking? If I put it down here, is the dog that is speaking? And then a, a, a deaf person will know when they are reading. Or what we are also doing is adding a label. So I tell you the name of the person once they change. And if I don't know who it is and it's nobody from here, I allow myself to do things like this. I use an arrow to tell you actually it's somebody from off the screen. We don't know. And it's somebody else talking in here. That's where the sound comes from. And you can use arrows in, in any direction yeah, to indicate that the sound is coming from somewhere else. So that's one of the things that you need to be alerted. 
sound effects, you also need to be uh, careful on, on how you present them. So you can just describe them, the tire pops and the kids scream, and then that's the information. And you can imagine that there must be havoc in this bus because there's a, an accident is about to happen or whatever. This one here, somebody's ringing, a telephone is ringing. So you get the onomatopoeia in Spanish of what a telephone sounds. Ring, ring. So you put it there. Now, this is a bit problematic because if you are deaf, you've never heard before. You don't know what an onomatopoeia is. You've never heard one. If you are hard of hearing, that you lost your hear because of an accident, or as we most of us do, because we become older, so you know all those sounds, and then straight away you relate to that. So this is a bit of a challenge when you try to combine deaf people and hard of hearing, because they are really different and they can be very different in their needs. Um, then you can also do the same. Uh, uh, you, ask, you add um, uh, a label and then you explain, okay, this guy is talking, but he's talking over a bullhorn. Yeah? And also you need to indicate instances where the deaf person might think that you're not doing your job. They can see that her lips are moving and you don't put any subtitles. And they say, well, hey, they've forgotten. There is a technical mistake here. But actually, what is happening is that she's speaking so low that we cannot, even us hearers, cannot tell. And then I alert, inaudible whispering. Nobody can hear. So don't worry, you're not missing anything. Even though her lips are moving, nothing is happening and nobody can hear what she's saying. So those are the things that we need to incorporate in our subtitles. You've got in here supra-segmental information. If he's drunk, if I write my subtitle, it's a little late, isn't it? It's going to feel that it's normal. Uh, so what I do is, okay, he's drunk. So you should be reading it. Oh, it's a bit late, isn't it? Yeah, and then that is what you are trying to understand the way he's presenting the information. Some people, what they do, they try with the text. So this character here in the middle, he is uh, foreign and he's speaking English with these two Americans, but he's at the same time stealing money from this guy. So he's trying to divert their attention. And then he's talking, this place is full of vultures. Vultures, because he's spelling it wrongly and he's play, uh, uh, speaking badly there. Vultures everywhere. Yeah, and then the everywhere was in capitals to call attention and to replicate a little bit the way that guy is speaking. It's not, this place is full of vultures, vultures everywhere, but it's more the intonation and that that's the way they try. And some people are now trying with smileys. Deaf people, if they are deaf, they will communicate with sign language and they will be much more visual than most of us are. And uh, English or Ukrainian or Spanish might be their foreign language because sign language is their mother tongue. And that's why I wrote deaf with a capital D because that is what deaf people do. They feel that they are like Ukrainians or Spaniards or British. They are deaf and they are from another community and therefore they should be capital as we capitalize other communities. Yeah, and that's why it's, it's used that way. So now because they're much more visual, some people use smileys because then you can see that this guy is being ironic. Otherwise I might have to write ironic in the way he's saying the information. But if I put a smiley with a wink, then it appears a bit more uh, entertaining and gives the information straight away. I don't need to be reading uh, any information there. This is one that I like very much. The, to what extent can you be explaining what sounds are going on and, and what information is in there? But that is the nature of doing this type of subtitles. Another area that you have to be careful with is music. Yeah, and you can just give the, the name of the singer and the title of the song, or you can transcribe the whole song. Uh, this symbol here, hash, is the traditional one. Remember, technology, analog technology was very limited, didn't allow any symbols. So it was an arbitrary decision that they were going to use the, high, the hash to indicate music, totally arbitrary. Little they know that then Twitter was, come to, was going to come along and then reinvent the use of hash. Yeah, but this is the traditional one approach. Now with digital technology, it's much easier to indicate with a note, a musical note, that what is in there is this guy singing. And this is a song, it's not dialogue, it's singing 
happening there. You can just, if there is no music, if there is no lyrics, then you need to probably explain what's happening. You can interfere and interpret. So it's a scary crime music, nostalgic music, melancholic. Deaf people sometimes don't like it because they think that is your interpretation. You know, do you think is nostalgic? Do you think is whatever? Uh, but how can you do it? Then you've got in here vivacious, a sparkling. Yeah. Or sometimes what they do, they are much more descriptive, funky music. Yeah, classical music. And then that's it. I'm not telling you the mood. I'm not telling you if this is exciting or if it's anything. It's just classical and nothing else. Yeah, so that is the way. And then if you've got multilingualism, again, you can say, well, okay, this woman here, she's speaking, the voice is computerized, so it's not a normal voice. And then she's speaking in a foreign language and we are not supposed to know. So that's why she's moving her lips, but nothing there. Then this guy is speaking with a French accent and it's important because the film is in France and blah, blah, blah. So I will put it in there, French accent, even though he's speaking in English. Yeah, uh, if I don't, I'm not going to give you the translation or whatever, I can say, well, both are speaking in Spanish and we are supposed not to know. The BBC sometimes what they do is actually they transcribe in Spanish. So if in this film, these two guys were speaking in Spanish or in U Ukrainian, they will speak in Spanish, knowing that as an, as an audience that can hear, if they know Spanish, they will understand. If they don't know Spanish, they won't understand what they're saying. So they think, okay, what will be the experience of people that hear? It will be that they can uh, understand if they know Spanish, then we're gonna do the same, replicate the same emotions with deaf people. And then in here, these guys are speaking, but it's speaking in Zulu and we're reading the translation. So I will explain to you, this is not the guy speaking in English, but he's speaking in his mother tongue and then the translation is in English. Yeah, and this is these are some of my favorites, uh, my favorite um, subtitles for deaf people that sometimes you just wonder uh, how angrily fix his bow tie. I'm not really sure, but that means uh, in there, I love tennis as I told you yesterday. And I think this one is great. It's tick tack, tick tack, tick tack. Uh, God knows how long it can go on for during the rally. And this lady here that, seems to be crying in a special way in Spanish. So I'm not sure if crying in English or crying in another language is different, the sobbing you do. But sometimes you have to be careful. And the, some of these can be understood by the deaf audience as being a bit patronizing as well. Listen, I don't hear, but I'm not stupid. Yeah, so there is a, a, a difference in what I need and you who don't know my needs and adding information that is redundant because I can see she's crying and I know uh, and I can see that he's uh, tying his bow and I can see his face that he's angry. So all that information I might not need, but it's still a long way to go um, in this. Now, uh, I ask you to do this, to watch the little clip. Um, I hope you did. And uh, I'll ask you now very quickly, uh, how many subtitles, more or less, will you put on your, uh, on the screen? I have tried it and um, I had like 20, but it was really difficult. <laughs> It is not one of the most difficult clips because it is it's only two people. Of course, for you, yeah, but yeah. not for us. They're not talking. Imagine one of these films when they start talking on one over the other one and, and, and they, they, they're talking two, three people at the same time and so on. Uh, but yes, this one, uh, they follow each other more or less, but it's a little bit, there is a period when it's a little bit, um, uh, you know, they, they, they feed in lots of information. So yes, there was a little thing there. So you've got 20, Lesia. Yes, and I wanted to ask, look, uh, sometimes I didn't know how it is better to do, to place their phrases in a one, like two, two lines consisting of uh, the uh, phrase of one person and the second, yeah. or to uh, make uh, two different like subtitles from that two lines. Yeah, that's what I wanted you to think, which I'm, I'm glad that it stimulated that sort of debate. This is what we call in the industry spotting. 
Yeah, and of course, once you are given a video, then you have to decide. There is no way the video will come like me talking, and then you have to decide when you're going to be feeding the subtitles. We know a few parameters. You wouldn't leave something on the screen that is much longer than six seconds. So you will have to chop it there. So that's going to be one of the parameters, and any pause is there. But then there are alternatives. There are options. If there is a short change, maybe you want your subtitles to leave before, uh, start later, and so on. There isn't a one way. There isn't just this is the way and nothing else. Uh, there are many ways of doing it. Uh, what you don't want to end up is with too many short subtitles because then that means that people are going to be always looking at the bottom of the screen, uh, finding the information. And what you want is more uh, completed sentences, as we said, so that you can enjoy the images and so on. Uh, but yes, it is a bit of a challenge on, on how you can do these things. And what I wanted to do is show you a possibility, a way in which you could do these subtitles. Um, has anybody got more subtitles than 20? We have some answers in, uh, in chat and yep. people write also 20, 25, uh, five subtitles. Uh, 31, somebody has written 31. Five subtitles, uh, oh, I don't know. Yeah, so we've got from 20 or something, okay. Then some people, Okay, somebody says they are now new and saying it's five subs portions, and then they've got phrases and so on. So, but we go from 20 till about 31, uh, which is a widespread um, in there. Now, I'm going to show you and give you a, a, a few uh, hinters here uh, on how, hold on, because I have it open here, uh, on how this could be done. And as I said, there are many ways of doing it, and it's not just one single way. Um, so, if you're moving in the 20s, you're okay. More than, less than 20, it will be very difficult because your timing will be all over the shop. And much more than that uh, will be, will mean that you are presenting information that is very, very short. Yeah. But let me just bring the video here and I'll show you what it should look like uh, in here. So we've got is encounter, and I'm going to use this video later as well. Oh. Let me see. I'm not sure why it's not working. There it is. I don't know why it wasn't recognizing it. So here we have, I can see my subtitles in here and you can see that I've been respecting my short changes. So I can see that there's a short change and my subtitle, the blue thing here, I'm asking to leave just before that. Yeah, and, and you could see, you will be seeing that for some of those, uh, let me see where I can move that. If I move that there, you can see that some of those, uh, if I move my subtitles uh, a bit down there, you can see that there, there was a short change and I'm asking my subtitle to start just after that. And this one here is leaving before. So I'm respecting technically, that was one of my considerations. And you can see that quite a few of them come to next to each other. So what I'm doing is leaving in between the two frames gap that I mentioned to you so that people will have nothing on the screen and then they can see again. Yeah. So let's go to the beginning here. Uh, let me see. Okay. And uh, okay, I'll put it there and you will see now the subtitles. Look, who are you? Look, who are you? It's one sentence, uh, it's a post at the beginning, it's a post afterwards, so that will be perfectly okay. And if followed by a post. So we've got the question there. I told you, George, I'm your guardian angel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now I can see that he's talking straight away yeah, and you yeah. can see yeah, that yeah. what I've done there yeah. is he talks and then I'm only right. leaving one, two, yeah. and then the next subtitle is coming there. So they're very close to each other, uh, but I cannot put them together because if I put them together here, this one will be too long. When I, when I put two people in the same subtitle, one line, top line is the first speaker, second line is the second uh, speaker. 
So I can see that the first speaker, I told you, George, I am, I am your guardian, your guardian angel. That's going to be too much to put in just one line. So I'm deciding, no, I'm going to leave it on his own there so that I can translate properly. And I might need to go into the second line because if not, I will have to write everything. I told you, George, I am your guardian angel, one line. And then what he says in the second line. So that's but may, may I ask you, how do you know that this all is too much for one line? It's just harder to read. You know it from your experience. Yeah. 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 Yeah, from my experience, if I've got here that all this it only is only lasting two seconds and a bit, three seconds, and my translation should have maximum forty-three characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can see that this one is already forty-four. So in Spanish, it's not going to be much, much shorter. And when we translate from English into other languages, particularly Latin languages, we tend to expand. The information so that might be a little bit of a challenge if i put this one together with this one for a start if i put all this in one line you can see that this is going to be 44 characters which is too long yeah so uh, it has no sense to place them together because you can't place more text in this um subtitle. i don't think you can i don't think you yeah, can yeah. however if you said okay what i'm gonna do is i told you george I'm going to translate, I decide, I told you, I don't need it in my translation. Because look who you are, George, I am your guardian angel. And I think I told you it's not needed. It, it doesn't add any information. And then in here, he says, yeah, yeah, I know. I can say, I know, you told me that. And I can delete, yeah, yeah. So that means that if I translate and I delete, I told you, um, there and then I delete yeah yeah then I could put these two together. Jorge, and what about the size of the symbols, the size of the characters? Is it standard one? But in here, as I said, when we're working with this, normally are Arial thirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's what it would allow me to. But because I am talking as well about 39 or 42 characters maximum, so that will already tell me, it doesn't matter how long, because what I'm saying here is only for my work, is what I'm saying. Then later when they embed it for transmission in uh, Netflix or to sell it as Blu-ray, they will do things. And then they can make it bigger or smaller, change the font to Netflix Sans or whichever font they want to use. Yeah, but this one now that I can see here is for my benefit to make sure that I can see properly my translation or that I can see properly the text on the screen. And I can make it bigger or smaller. If you wanted to make it smaller, you can make it smaller or even bigger if you don't see properly on the screen. No, I just hint that if the size is smaller, you can stuff more text. You could, but if you can only do 39 characters per line, it doesn't matter. That's it. Okay. Even if it's a smaller, it's 39. Okay. Yeah. You're so okay. if you were working with the safe area, then yes. If you are not caring about how many characters, but only that it fits the safe area, then that would be fine. Okay. You Thank can you. write more. And the, the smaller, the more text. But Netflix, most companies, unless they have, they, they trust you and they know you've got a lot of experience, they will tell you, no, 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 keep to a maximum 42. Don't do um, safe area, 42. So on 42, there is no problem there. Yep. So I will, myself, I will do two different ones in here. Yep. And I wouldn't condense too much information. I know, for instance, that number three, when I translate into Ukrainian, is going to be giving me trouble because already in English, is far too fast. It's 22.5 characters. And I need to reduce that to uh, whatever it is, 15 or 17. It's easy, as you can see, to reduce. I can say, OK, fine. The yeah, yeah, I can say, I know, and now I'm, I'm safe. Yeah, the red is gone and I'm happy and the computer is also happy. So those are the things that I will have to do. But what I tend to do in my teaching is I will give the students everything and they decide. They are linguists. So they decide what is important, what is not important. You know, I'm not going to be deciding for them. OK, if they say yes, yes, I know they are repeating the same information, the same 
statement three times. Yes, yes, and I know it means the same. So you can only leave it once. But since I'm training them, I tell them, okay, this is what they say. What would you delete? What information do you think is redundant here so that your translation is going to fit in here? And that is for them to decide. So I usually, most of the times I work with a full transcription of what they say so that the students will decide how then they play with their translation and manipulate it. Okay, so uh, I'll do two here, but as I said, Lesia, if you want it, I told you, you think that is not really important, it's not added much information, so you could do two subtitles here, I can do, uh, sorry, not that, I can do this, I can put them together, you can see now I've, I've uh, merged them together, if I go there, and I've got my little uh, shortcut, which means that now they're together, they last 4.14, this is going to be a problem, but I can say, OK, fine, I'm not going to translate. I told you. So George, I'm your guardian angel. And then I will do um, this is the way we normally present the information when I've got two people on the screen. One a hyphen implies first speaker, second hyphen, second speaker. And then I've got George, I'm your guardian angel. I know you told me that. Yeah? And I can see now what it looks like. I told you, George, I'm your guardian angel. Yeah, yeah, I know. You told me that. Yeah. And that's what it would look like. So I can change it that way. This is not a big change. Uh, I'm happy with you. I will have to reduce a bit more than in my initial um, selection of the information. But these are the things that you will have to consider when you do, when you do the spotting and, and decide where and how you're going to do it. Look here. It's alerting me that a change is going to happen, and, and you will see how that happens. Now it's changing, and I can see him from a different angle. What else are you? What are you? Yeah, I can see that there is a pause there, so that's why I put all that information yeah. in there together. What else are you? What are you? Traditionally, uh, or uh, these days, uh, most companies will ask you if you can put everything into one line put it into one line, yeah? Because then it occupies less space in the images. Now, personally, I think it would probably look better if you had it like this. What else are you? What are you? Two different sentences, two ideas come in here, and then you can see them split. Uh, but more and more, they will tell you no, because then you can see this is covering nearly his face, it's a bit higher up. So if it fits in one line, then just put it in one line and it goes down, and then you take less space of the image. Yeah, so Netflix now makes it in the regulations. Please, if you can put it in one line, you do. Yeah, so that's one there. Then the following one, I've decided to put them together. As Lesia was saying earlier on, I can put them together. And remember, we can only do two lines. So that means that I cannot have more than this. It's one, one, and then I have to leave because then somebody else needs to come into the subtitle. Yeah, what are you? You a hypnotist? No, of course not. Well, that yeah, and then he continues talking. So you can see in here that my subtitle only leaves two frames. Very, very close. The other subtitle begins and it has to be after the other two. So that will be my subtitle number five. You can see the numbers here. So I'm on five. Why am I seeing all these strange things here? Don't you understand, George? Yeah, I left that one on his own because I want to put these ones together. It's because you were not born. If I wasn't born, who am I? These two are similar semantically. One is saying it's because you're not born. Well, if I'm not born, if I wasn't born, who am I? So it goes together quite nicely. So that's why I've decided to do, don't you understand George? Rather than, rather than saying, don't you understand George? It's because you were not born. And then the next subtitle, if I wasn't born, who am I? I've decided, don't you understand George? And then the other two will be easier because they are relating to this concept of being born. And if I'm not born, who am I and whatever. So that's why I've decided to do those that way. But you can see that from now on, they all come consecutive. They are one after the next, and I'm only leaving, remember, those two little frames in between. Separation, 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 and they're all written together. This is, it looks a bit, less has said, it's difficult because they're speaking so much. But in effect, it's quite easy because the only thing you need to do is decide what is the end, and then straight away, two frames, nothing more. Chain, two frames, not two frames. 
So once you decide this is the end, you don't need to consider anything else. You do two frames, start again, the new subtitle. And this is what now Netflix tells you to do. This is what we call in the industry, chained subtitles. I'm chaining them, they're all like in a chain, and I'm leaving only two frames. Maybe here I could leave, you can see behind that there is a little bit of a pause. I could probably leave five frames or seven frames, but then that breaks the rhythm of reading. So we prefer to leave only two, don't leave, if it's gonna be two, five, six, just do two. Two frames only, separation. So they chained and they are balanced and they appear um, uh, rhythmically. So that's easy. Once you know that, then you just do everything. When I finish, next one, two frames and straight in. Only here I'm going to be leaving a post. So you've got number five well, there. Well, then why am I seeing all these strange things? Don't you understand, George? It's because you were not born. Well, if I wasn't born, who am I? You're nobody. You have no identity. Oh, what do you mean, no identity? My name's George Bailey. There is no George Bailey. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you saw those subtitles, if you followed something similar, uh, but that is the sort of way uh, that sometimes I'm going to be putting them together because I think it makes sense, particularly when you've got a question and an answer. You know, if somebody's asking and then somebody replies as a viewer, you know that there is a question, you're going to be expecting an answer and you don't want to be the answer coming later on. So unless it's a, a, a punch, uh, a, a pun or, or, or it's a play on words. So what I'm going to do is trying to put them together and, and you can see that none of them is going to be more than six seconds. None of them is going to be less than one second either. So you've got here. You have no papers, no cards, no driver's license, no 4F card, no insurance policy. They're not there either. Now I've got a long pause. So those ones, they were more uh, sporadic. There was more time between the subtitles. So that allowed me to, to, to come them, to come with the subtitles, okay? Here you can see just after the short change, here before the short change, I'm going to be taking them out. What? Zuzu's petals. You can see in here, what? there is a short change. You are going to see that what? the camera changes, it goes there. But my problem here was that before, before that change, he only says what? It's very short. It's going to be one of those that I need to leave at least one second. And then straight away, the other one says, Susu's petals. It's a question, it's an answer. There is no mystery on this answer. So here, I'm not respecting the short change because I think it doesn't help for the understanding. So what I'm doing, so if you saw there, I've got all together, I've got 24 subtitles, 25 I started with, but I was persuaded by Lesia that probably I should merge two subtitles because of the information. So I did that. So I'm moving around that. Uh, it will be difficult to merge much more. Maybe you've got here this one, I can tell, you know. You, you, you're, you, you're crazy, that's what I think. You're, you're screwing. You know, it's all together. It comes pretty much together. You, your, I can tell, is a lot of repetition. So if I was to translate, I can say, you are crazy. And the person will understand that it's saying you are, you are, you're crazy. So I can only put it once, that will be fine. I can see that if I put them together, this one is 221 and this one is 110. So it's gonna be more than three seconds, but it's not gonna be six. So technically I could put them together and the idea is the same. You're crazy, that's what I think, you're screwy. So if I have to translate because of so much repetition in here, I could also decide, okay, I'm going to uh, put them together and then say, okay, that's what I think, you're screwy. Yeah, I, I, I know, look, it's 18 characters. I know it's very long, but when I translate, I'm gonna say you're, and then I'll probably delete that one. I'll say, you're, you're crazy. That's what I think, you're screwy. Yeah, and I can easily um, make it be within the characters per second in my translation. So that was an easy one because of the repetition that is involved in the original. Yeah, and then I will end up with about 23 subtitles. Yeah, so that's, those are the possibilities. There isn't one way or another. The clip is very, very short. It just lasts one and a half minutes. 
So you don't want to have too many subtitles because that means that you are all the time keeping your eyes down here. So you don't want short subtitles that stay for a second and then another one and then another one. I want subtitles that, you know, four seconds, two, I had another one of four seconds so that they are a bit of time so that people can read. And if you read fast, then you can go and enjoy the images. Yep. Any comments here or anything that was unclear or that you struggled when you were working with this platform? All Capito? I see. Everything seems to be clear now, thanks. Yeah, okay, good. So one thing that I would like to tell you as well, if you are teaching, so you say you're happy with this. You produce this in English, and then what I'm gonna tell now students is, okay, here you have the original. I am more interested than anything on your technical, on your linguistic skills. Can you translate into Ukrainian? How do you know the, can you convey the nuances of the original? So I don't want the technical side because we will do another exercise on that. What I really want to know now is your linguistic expertise. How much English do you know? How good are you at expressing ideas in Ukrainian? So what I can do is say, okay, fine. What I'm gonna do now is this document, I'm gonna save it. Now it's saved. Yeah, it's all the time, it's kept on the platform. But what I want to do now is give it to my students so that they can come and work. Yeah, and what I can do here is import, export, as you would do in any Word documents or anything. So I go import, export. I will be exporting so that I can get a copy and give it to my students. So I export and then in subtitles, you've got lots and lots of formats. Now, if you're working with Una, then you can save it as Una and give it to your students. But if say you're working with freeware, you don't want to use Una and you're working with freeware, you can save it as SRT. SRT is a very common format for subtitles, particularly on the internet. So I'm gonna save it as SRT, yeah? and I will export. And take a look here at the bottom of my screen. Let me, I'm going to clean that so that you can see. And there is nothing. Oh, senor. Okay, so um, I'm going to now export, and then you see here at the bottom of the screen, and here I have my document, export, yeah? So I called it Encounter. So now I'm gonna save it here on my screen, and I can send it to you, or I can send it to my students or whatever. If you're working with freeware, I've got here Subtitle Workshop, I could just open it there or subtitle edit and they will see all the times and everything and they can start working. And that's what I'm gonna show you um, how to, to do with uh, an exercise, okay? So what I did is I created it. You could ask if you've got a good student, you could ask, okay, here you have a video, produce the subtitles uh, in English and then you can use this, which in the industry we call template. Mm -hmm. And then you can give it to your students to translate. So the technical dimension is being done, but what you are paying attention is to the actual linguistic expertise, which is, of course, one of the things that they will have to work on. No? So in such way, you may use practically each uh, video from internet. You just have to know that you have right to use this video. Yeah. Uh, translation. Yes. yes. Well, I'll come to that. But yes. Yes. Um, I don't want to enter into copyright and we are recording, um, but is, if it's for educational purposes, uh, you can use uh, quite a lot of a number of videos. Um, for the book that I've come up with, I'm using public domain films. So you've got films like Wonderful, It's a Wonderful Life, Charade and so on. They're all public domain. Anybody can use them. 
there is no problem. And then if you ask any YouTubers, most of them will be happy for you to use their material for translation and so on. And there are YouTubers of talking about cars. So if you want to do any technical language, do they know your students? Do your students know how to deal with technical ter te te terminology? You can use videos like that. Yeah. What I'm finding more and more is that some companies want, want people that know how to do or to work with subtitles, but also more and more in specific areas. They say, you know, we need somebody for subtitling, but do they know about medicine? Because this is going to be a TV series all on medicine, or it's going to be for documentaries, and all the documentaries are medical. So I want not just subtitling, but somebody who knows about medicine. Uh, Portugal or many other countries, when they got thematic TV stations that do sports. And, and they will be watching Spanish football in Spanish with subtitles. Yeah, and they will be asking you, okay, somebody who knows about sports or who is willing to learn about sports and they've got that expertise, not just anyone. So more and more, but I guess it's the same as in translation. Translation, we started more generally, uh, literary translation and so on. And now we specialize in many areas and people have to specialize. Until now, people said, okay, I do subtitling and that's all. But more and more companies are asking, okay, you do subtitle, but what are your fields of expertise within subtitling? What, what do you think will be your main area? And yes, you can tell a film is different to a documentary. Uh, and then you need to have different skills to document yourself and find the information and so on. Jorge, there are two questions in the chat. You practically answered one of them, but there is still the second. Uh, can you read it for me? Yes, are subtitles more independent than translators that prepare text for dubbing, since the dubbing team may influence even the reverse the translation suggested? In that sense, uh, yes. Um, dubbing, uh, a dubbing translator will translate uh, what we call like a draft translation and then they will send it to the dubbing director and the dubbing actors and so on and then the changes can be really really big and that's the traditional approach in Spain in Italy in France in Germany uh, and that, that's the bit the way we've done it historically what is happening more and more is that we are adopting uh, the uh, French approach to do dubbing and the French approach is that the same way you get a video and then at the bottom of the screen, you write your text and then you can see, um, how can I explain? I've got videos, but you can see if you've got a lot of time and your translation is very short, then your letters will be elongated. As if you have to read, I need more sleep because that is going to be in this, the character speaking for two seconds. So you, he's telling you, well, maybe you need to write more. And then he will tell you, okay, I need more sleep if I want to function. And then the text becomes smaller. And then you can tell, okay, this fits better because the other one was too elongated and it was too little text for that sort of presentation. Yeah. So they are now telling you more. So that means that as a translator, you could also take care of the adaptation and make sure that your text is not too short, too long. It could fit the mouth and things like this. Something that traditionally has been done by the dubbing director. But now more and more is slightly changing and translators are being asked to do, okay, you really know the language. If you learned a bit more, then you could just come up with a translation that is not too long. It's not much to learn. If they say, um, I love you, don't write, I'm madly in love with you and your body. You know, you know, it's not going to fit. That's that's not much to know. So you learned a little bit, and and that's what they're expecting, because it's quicker, because it allows you to to deliver work that is ready to to produce. So yeah, traditionally, as a translator, as a dubbing translator, you you couldn't take, you didn't have much uh, say on the final production, but that is changing. And in subtitling, these days you do the translation and, and then might be, well, it is, there is a revision. So as, as we do in other types of translation, so somebody will read your translation, they will be, you will give you comments and then you will uh, accept or reject those changes. And there is a drive by the likes of Netflix, for instance, to acknowledge the name of the translators. 
and they feel that if you write your name and it is your production, then you will feel much more, uh, you will take it more like a child. You will say, okay, this is my little baby. Uh, my name is going to be there. So I want to really work and make it as best as I can so that, you know, my family can be proud of me and my boyfriend or my girlfriend, when they see my name, they say, oh, wow. That was really well done and blah, blah. So that is the drive. But traditionally, very few people will recognize the name of the translators. And this is a fight by many associations because with the recognition comes as well royalties and the possibility of gaining money from the repetition of your shows as we do in literary translations. The more books you sell, the more you get as a translator for your royalties. So we, we fight in that corner for audiovisual translators as well. Yeah. Any other questions there? Not more. No? Uh, there was a question about uh, the intellectual property, but you answered it, as I understand it. Okay. And, and at the end, if you want, we can uh, discuss it a bit more. And I will refer you to different places where you can find more about um, uh, royalties as opposed to copyright. Yeah, because they are two different concepts. Okay, so let's see now uh, what I was planning to do uh, today. And, and as always, I talk too much and then I've got too much information for you. And I can see that we are nearly one hour into the session today. So here you've got a few exercises that I, I, I propose to you and you can use them. What I give to my students, particularly when I start is reduction exercises, how would you reduce the text that I'm giving you? Now, I treat them at the beginning and I tell them, can you please uh, reduce this in within English so that we can see what do you think is relevant? What do you think is not relevant and so on? And they start doing things. And then I say, well, that was a bit naughty of myself because if I ask you, can you reduce this? Yes, but it's a great theory, blah, 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 blah your immediate answer will be, well, I, I don't know. I cannot do it unless you tell me how long are they speaking? If they are speaking for uh, five seconds, probably I don't need to reduce anything. But if they are speaking for one and a half seconds or two seconds, yes, then I will have to reduce. So we don't reduce just because we want to reduce. And this is one of the challenges we're finding now for machine translation. Because the same translation, the same text, it can be translated in different ways because of technical dimension. So if I don't have time, I have to reduce. And then a literal translation won't be helpful. So if this one was, yeah, but it's a great theory. Have you been paying attention? This is a great theory. Then I don't have to reduce because I was very slow. But this comes from a film when they are speaking like this, it's in a, in a restaurant, they've been drinking. Oh yeah, but it's a great theory. Haven't you been attention? This is a great theory. That's the way they're talking in this bar. So there, you really need to condense. Yeah, and then that's what I explained to them. So now that you know that they're speaking fast, what do you think in here linguistically is redundant? And of course, if there is a repetition, it's a great theory. It's a great theory is telling me that it's important. So I will have to leave it in my translation. Imagine this is uh, two seconds, and two seconds is 15 characters per second, 30 seconds, 30 characters. So imagine you need to translate into Spanish, 30 characters. What do you delete? So you know, okay, I need to leave. It's a great theory. Uh, have you been paying attention? It's a rhetorical question. Actually, it's not answer to that question. So probably if I need to take information out, the Paying attention probably is the one that is going to go. And the very important thing here is the contradiction between the speakers. This one, yeah, which is very English. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to be in agreement with you. However, bang, 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 which is something that they do very often. There is nothing worse in English that somebody telling you, oh, it's very interesting. Oh, so, God, there we go. However, bang, 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 bang. And then they just, uh, you know, kill your arguments. So in here is the same, yes, but. So I need this but to show the conflict between the two. And I show them the translation which has been done really, the real translation, which is this one. Yes, but it's a great theory. 
And this is what it happens in the subtitles. You can find lots of subtitles from, from any DVD or from the internet that, that you can see how this can be done with examples in uh, Ukrainian, for instance, and then show them how sometimes it is deleted information uh, that is repeated, but sometimes information goes because it doesn't fit in and you cannot put it in there. This is a very common, people are speaking uh, very fast. Uh, isn't that Sheila, what do you mean? Sheila knocking on your door, oh yes. You know, and there is something, these four people, four turns, if I can only do two and blah, blah, but a common solution here, uh, sorry, I, I jump over that, but a common solution here, isn't Sheila knocking on your door? Yes, and what I am doing is mixing this and the four turns become two. And again, very common in subtitling that you can find there. This one here, uh, of course, the question, we, we change sometimes, here the question, so tell me something that is hedging, that is a way of coming into the question. The translation here is, why don't you have kids? It's much more aggressive, it's much more direct. This one here is, so tell me something, you know, because the question is gonna be very, very personal. So again, they can see how you change the approach and they have to be careful not to do it all the time. Otherwise the character might come across as being aggressive. What do you do with, with, with Miss Thelma? you translate or not. Well, it really depends. If it's at the beginning of the film, chances are that you cannot because that is the, the director telling us, this is Miss Thelma. So this is not Luis, this is not some, somebody else is Miss Thelma. If it's later on the film when we know who she is, probably I can afford to delete Miss Thelma because it's clear who she is. I take it off because it cannot fit in. So that's the way you start making students think about what the text is in there. Chances are that your students probably have done literary translation or a specialized translation, and they find it very, very difficult to delete information or to just reformulate the information. And I always tell them, this is a little bit like interpreting. You have to get the idea, what is the most important here? and then try to reflect it again without betraying what they're saying in there and remembering that they are hearing as well what they say in there. But if you translate literally, you're doomed for failure because you will always find that it's too long and so on. And I was training the Spanish team at the European Parliament recently. And, and that was, they told me, you know, can we do exercises of this nature? Because we find it very, very challenging to delete because we spend all our lives documenting ourselves, finding the right term. And now you're telling us, oh no, sometimes you just get rid of that and find a synonym that is shorter or whatever. So, and then you've got changing. I wonder if you can really find the car. Very easy solutions here. Can you find the car? We're going to go after our dinner. We'll go after dinner. So you can do this if you are, in my case, I deal with, um, can somebody close? It's a lovely conversation behind, but if you can mute yourselves so that we can. Yeah. Can we know who is the person? Uh, uh, I only see one participant who hasn't muted. Maybe you can mute. It's Olha Shumeiko. Yeah. Okay, I send, uh, uh, let me see. Yes, I send an email, uh, a message. Okay, so in here again, you can do it in English. Um, in my case, I've got students from many languages or you can do it directly in, in um, uh, Ukrainian and then work with these sorts of activities. But they are uh, very, very essential for, for any person that wants to uh, gain these skills. I give them this example here in German so that they always see uh, how it's done and so on and in languages that they don't understand and they rely completely in the subtitles. I usually, uh, one of the problems is that students sometimes find it difficult to relate because they all know English and, and they're working into whichever language. So they all relate, they hear the original and they feel, oh yes, but this and the other. And it's a good exercise. Sometimes I ask my Chinese students to translate into English from Chinese. And we are totally and utterly dependent on the subtitles. We cannot really get much from the soundtrack. And that is a very different experience for the students to, to then realize, you know, okay, I, I cannot follow the original. So I have to really see what is saying in the original. This is an example from German. I give them, that's what they say in German. A very literal translation so that they can see what it is and then I show them this example uh, that's the subtitle that you find on the DVD and they can see how lots of information is being reformulated the uh, Silver Harmer military hospital has disappeared but if I am leaving a nurse then clearly I must be in a place where nurses are which is usually a hospital 
Yep. So that's what I am doing in there, uh, working uh, mm -hmm. with them to show, you know, don't be afraid if you need to delete information in your subtitles. Line breaks, uh, always one of the key issues in subtitling, you need to make them aware that, you know, we want to help reading the information on the screen. Subtitles appear, disappear. You cannot go back to them or usually you don't go back to them. It's not the usual way of watching a film. You don't want to be stopping all the time because you didn't understand what they were saying. So one way of facilitating reading is by segmenting the information uh, on a screen. If I ask you here, do you think that any of these sentences can be read better than the other? They're all the same. It's the same content with the same comma and the same full stop. So in theory, they probably are all the same because I'm not changing the content at all. But do you think anything here might be better? And I can see some people say four. Second one, four one. I would agree that number four is the one. But simply because what I've done here is I've also done the linguistic analysis. And I'm saying, okay, my whole life, what? I've been followed by loneliness. And I'm presenting it in a way that the grammar, the syntax comes through in my subtitles. And this is something that, again, you know, if you are tested by any company, the first thing they're going to say is, how do you segment your information? It's not that it looks nice, but it is that it looks grammatically sensible and it's going to speed up my reading. I don't want to, to read my whole life I've been followed. That could be the end of my subtitles. Yeah, but it's not the end, it's by loneliness. Yeah, and the same concept, and this is another thing that I do with my students, I show you this so that you experience it. How do you like these subtitles? Did you read them okay? Probably not. Yeah, the information, welcome to the first of our of four programs. And then you think that's it, finished the sentence. And then it's a, in this series. So you have to go back to the previous one and to recuperate the information to complete. Look, the same information, more or less, presented in what we will say a proper way in subtitling. So in this one, you can see, as opposed to the other ones, you can see that my synthesis, my, this sentence is finished, this one is finished, and I tell them with a full stop so that they can enjoy the images. These ones, none of them is finished. I'm always expecting the viewers to continue reading so that they can complete the information. And they're not gonna be able to go to the screen and watch the images. Whereas in this one here, welcome to the first of four programs in this series. If you are a fast reader, then you can watch what is going on in the images because the idea is complete. This is a new idea. Every four weeks, we're gonna be doing something. You're telling me that this is not complete. England here, they've got no punctuation. So I'll probably wait and quick enough, they should be the, end, the second part of the sentence that I can read. Then it's finished, the yes complete, and then I move to another one. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to block them in a way that they make sense, that they're not keeping the information halfway and that people can complete and enjoy the images at the same time. So these are the type of exercises that you should be uh, doing at the beginning and making aware or instill in your students. I mentioned to you uh, the publication of this book, which has been just very recently, and this is what it contains. Um, it gives you an idea. Uh, it's, it's pretty okay in the sense, uh, if you wanted to use this for a course, I don't know how long your courses are in, um, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, in the UK, our terms tend, be, tend to be 10 weeks of teaching. Uh, more or less uh, in, in most universities. Um, so this more or less follows that, that you could use one of these chapters every week. One thing that I find with my students is that they don't like too much theory um, at the beginning and they prefer to do the hands-on. They prefer to work and start playing. And, and I've come to the conclusion that I, I'd rather get them get things wrong by enjoy what they are doing and then play and then find that they've done it wrong and so on. And then building through their errors and mistakes, we build up how they can improve and how they can do things better. So I do, as I've done briefly with you, is 
very brief introduction of a couple of hours, two, three hours, and, and then they get all the information and then we go and see the program. They play with the software, they start doing things, and then every week I add a little bit more. And they say, okay, now let's discuss about, uh, you know, uh, theories, or let this, let's discuss about cultural references, or let's discuss about what you can see in the images, or something else. But at the beginning, at least, they can start practicing, and they can play, and so on. And in my experience, that's always that they really enjoy, and, and, and I can then afford to test them at the end with the software. If you leave it till too late, then they can say, well, we haven't had enough exposure to the technology for the test and for whatever we need to do in there. Now, the book, as I mentioned to you, comes with um, different, uh, you know, the, the UNA, of uh, several exercises, wing caps, and also a companion website. So uh, when you go there in the website, you've got a book of exercises that contains about 50 pages, a bit more than 50, and is divided like this. So you've got one exercise to get familiar with UNA, very, very simple clip with uh, the guidelines and um, and the clip is they probably I don't remember now less than 10 subtitles in between five and 10 subtitles so that it's not too onerous that they can see a completion of a task and it's done in there and the same if they want to work with WinCaps. WinCaps is not is a desktop based uh, so you have to install it on your computer but it's professional is the one that they use the large corporations and is a traditional one. Uh, if you were if you were to buy it, it will cost you in the thousands of pounds. Yeah, but they allow us to use it uh, for a period of time, so you can download it and play with it, and it's the full version. Yeah, you can see exactly what anybody else does in the industry, and then exercises per chapter. And what type of exercises can you do? Then in here, I've come up with some of the exercises. Some of them are sort of theoretical, if you want me to say that. Uh, I give them a quote, they get a quote, uh, and then discussions on, on how that can be understood. What do they think about this and about that? So there are many of those exercises, prompting them uh, to, to something like that. Or then if I've done a little bit of theory in class, the nature of subtitling, and then I ask them, about you know, how it's done in your country, take a look at five videos or five programs. Did you find any similarities, any discrepancies? So everything is more, um, you, know, you don't need much to be asking these questions. Yeah? Uh, in other ones, what I do is, okay, I've already got material and then you've got here website companion. Um, so I've developed or we have developed an activity. This is a video talking about subtitling. And, and then you can find the video on the companion website with questions about the video and then uh, a key with answers to those questions in there. So the whole thing is exploited. Yeah, and this again is more general. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on uh, the professional practice. So there is an exercise here with, I've co we've compiled several job ads uh, companies, real companies asking for real subtitlers with what skills they require and so on. So they are, those job descriptions are here in the website in this exercise. So the student can read the job descriptions. Do they think they fit in? What skills do they think they are missing? Uh, how can they hone those skills or whatever? So that's another type. We find you the material is in there and, and they can play with that. And then what we do, we have lots of activities as well, working with the software. And they will be alerting you these activities to be done with WinCaps, or this one is to be done with UNA. And then you've got there instructions, the script, you've got the video, and then you've got as well the soft, the, the subtitles. Yeah, the documents so that you don't need to do anything. You can just pass that to your students and then they can do the, the exercises. And here you find as well, uh, some other activities where you can, your students or you can decide. The activity can be done either with UNA or with WinCaps for you to choose. And then you have more material in the website to choose from. So you can tell the students, okay, this one you can do with both, but we're gonna do with UNA or with WinCaps or whatever. So all that material is in there. In the website, we came up with over 300 documents for all the exercises. As you can see, this exercise, for instance here, will contain four different uh, documents. 
between videos, subtitles, uh, instructions, and, and so on. So that's what you can find there and, and the way you can exploit uh, these ones if you want to be more theoretical or if you want to be really more hands-on and get your students to be doing uh, the work. The subtitle environment, as Lesia was asking at the beginning, I told you there are commercial programs and the one that we are using here is WinCaps, which as I said is, is professional, is commercial. You have to pay uh, to use it. Uh, the same as all these, AC titles, Fav, Swift, Spot, Title Vision, they're all used in the industry and they are developed for the industry. But unfortunately, you have to pay for those. There are also freeware, uh, programs and you've got some of them here. Uh, Subtitle Workshop, Subtitle Edit are probably the, some of the most famous ones together with um, AG or AG Soup. Sub. Um, in the book, you've got as well in the website, in the companion website, a list with also information on which ones work well with Mac. Yeah, freeware that you can use on Mac because usually Mac doesn't work well with subtitling software. Yeah, but um, in that book, if anybody needs anything, please let me know and I can send you this information. You say, Jorge, uh, I'm struggling. Can you send me the list and these appendixes? I can send them to you as I the well the same way as I did with the um, the guidelines to use the the Una platform. So any of this material I can show and and no problem. And this is what it looks in um, Wing Cups. That's the environment. And this is what it looks in subtitle edit. And again, information there. And this is uh, the things that you can do technically, but you've already seen the speech to text. You can see how you can, uh, the sound wave and you can see the text written there um, and all that information that is helping us to produce our subtitles. That's the technical uh, dimension that we are developing more and more in, in subtitling. Uh, let me move a little bit because I want to, one thing, but I don't want to, I know you are uh, fretting and I'm worried about oh, how am I be going to be teaching something that I don't know too much about that. Only a brief mention here that now we're also working with machine translation and memory tools. They are becoming into the area of subtitling and Trados, SDL Trados, uh, just a couple of years ago in 19, uh, 2019, they came up with an API. Uh, if you use Stratos, it's free. You can use it. Uh, it's not great, but to me, it's interesting that they are already seeing subtitling as an area where they want to embed their own cut tools and so on. You've got MemoQ as well. They're doing this and many other companies that are doing uh, applying machine translation, memory tools, and so on to the workflow of subtitling. I'm not going to go too much in detail, but for you to know that this is an area that is growing. If you are into technology and if you want more information, I can send you information. Una is working in that direction as well, and they are doing testing um, in, in this area. Uh, the cloud, you are one of the ones that have already seen and you can access how it works. Uh, there is, you know, uh, um, some um, clouds on the internet, for instance, TED, uh, the platform that but they produce subtitles, uh, free subtitles for all these educational um, technology, uh, educational talks. Uh, if you know TED, T-E-D, that is a cloud base. They do it all in the cloud. You volunteer your subtitles and so on. And they've been around for a long time. They're not commercial. They're not really good for the industry. And that's why the industry has started. And now everybody has got their own platform. Yeah, everybody's, and this is what we think is going to be the future. It's going to be cloud-based, and we're going to be working in the cloud without having to install anything on our uh, computers. Yeah. Uh, these are the pros, and I will leave it to you. I'm going to be sending this to you so you can read it with calm. Why people are going to the uh, cloud and what are the, the potential benefits uh, for the industry. Uh, and there is as well, there are a few cons. And, and, and things that are not so good. Um, and again, I'm, I'm listing them here and then you can go in detail when you've got more time and, and read those uh, things there. Now, one thing that we use in the industry a lot is templates. Yeah? And templates, basically what it is, is a document that contains the time codes that the timing, the spotting has been done. And I'm going to concentrate only on the uh, translation. You can see, 
that it makes sense for a company like Netflix to have, if they're gonna do a stranger things in 32 languages, the technical dimension, if you've been playing with Una, even though it's not uh, complicated, is onerous. It takes time to produce because you have to go through all the technicalities and so on. So if you're gonna be translated into 32 languages, then you don't want to spend all that time, 32 times, doing it individually. So what they are doing is creating a template in English, like the one I've done for Wonderful, the encounter. I create it in English, I send it to you, and then you do the translation. And then when you bring it back, I can put it in my platform and I can see what you've done and so on. And this is one way that the industry is working more and more. And this is something that you should be doing and contemplating with your students. They can do the technical dimension, but they should also work with templates. Traditionally, that's what they look like. It is numbers. And then here, one, two, three, four, that's what you need to translate. And here, some companies, they did them a bit more uh, sophisticated. There are macros here. And in this blank space, if I start writing, when I go to 39, it throws me out and it doesn't allow me to write more on the line and blah, blah, blah. The subtitle number one, the duration two seconds, begins here, ends there, and then I need to translate. Now, what we have is in the platform. Uh, on the cloud. So this is one of the largest, this is the one that the European Union is using. And this is one of the, is the largest uh, company or the fast growing, the fastest growing company in the world <coughs> in audiovisual translation. <coughs> they are Swedish in Gothenburg and this is their platform. And you can see uh, similar, not the same, but similar to the other one. You've got here your video, you've got your times, then you've got the template. So they've got here Amadeus was operation, what operation. So everything has been done for you in English. And then you are expected here at the bottom to translate. So you've got the template Amadeus what operation, and then they're asking you to translate here. And when you write here, it will go red if you've written too much or giving you information. You can also format your text in here and then you can add comments if you need to, if you are doing the revision of somebody else's work. Yeah. This is the, the, the work environment towards we are going to. And this is going to be in the industry. This is now in the industry. And this is what everybody else is saying. This is the future. That's the way we're going to be working. Yeah. And you've got another one, a large corporation called SDA Media. That's the way it looks for them. Basically the same concept again. You got your video, you've got the English, you translate into your languages. Okay. So that's the way you, we're going to be working. And this is what you've already seen in um, here. Uh, now what I want to do yeah, these are the pros. If you're working with templates, of course, because you're not doing the technical dimension, then you can speed up your translation. You're only doing the, the link only, but you're doing the linguistic side, but you're not spending time on the technical dimension. So you can produce more subtitles. Uh, that's cheaper for the company because you are going to be more productive, but also they only need one person to do the technical dimension rather than one each, each language. If you are a project management, uh, a project manager, then it's easier to work with um, uh, looping the new Netflix series that you know is going to be in 30 languages and you know that subtitle in series one, subtitle 22 is problematic because they're using swear words. Yeah, and then you know that in any language you can go to that subtitle. And subtitle 82 is funny and you want to make sure that it's going to be funny in the translation. And then you know that in all the languages, 82 should be funny. And it's easy for you to check for compliance or for anything. So it's, it's much easier in there. And if you are teaching, it's also good in the sense that if you give all your students the template, then when it comes to comparing your solutions and discussing potential uh, translations, you are all working to the same parameters. They all are working to the same conditions. Otherwise, if they all do different uh, timings, then they may say, well, in my case, the timing allows me for more text, so my translation is different and it's longer and it's not longer or whatever. So at the beginning, when you wanted to compare and see how they're doing things, then that may be also uh, a very good solution. You're working as if you were with a written text, only that they're gonna be working in the platform and they're going to be seeing the videos and, and seeing them translation. But all the solutions can be easily compared in between 
uh, the students. And then some of the issues, problems that you should be aware. Sometimes when they are translating from written text, they sort of lose track of the audio. And what I do sometimes, I give them a template that contains mistakes. So I'll give them the year, they say in 1985, and I write in 1975, and see whether they are alert and, and looking. So proper names, I sometimes change the name, uh, the surname, I put the H in a place that it doesn't belong to, or things that I know they might be uh, not aware of. Uh, Punctuation, I tend to use British punctuation that we don't use in Spanish and then see whether they calculate as well. You, you, know, you need to be careful that you know, you're know you not copying because now you are translating from written text. You still need to be listening to the original because that is what you are translating. Anybody's gonna be listening and reading your subtitles. They're not gonna be watching the template. Yeah, the working document. So I try to do that with the students uh, and make sure that they are uh, familiar. So what I'm, I want to do now is uh, give you a few examples on how I could do my, um, how I can exploit uh, my subtitles here. Yeah. And here I show you uh, I've shown you this file, create. Yeah, they create pro. They create pro, uh, you've already seen, uh, is very simple, uh, allows you to play a video here and then you create your subtitles and, and that's what you have to do. And then you've played already and I'm pleased with that and very simple. You can then import your uh, subtitles and, and then send them to your students or if your students are working with freeware, you can they can send them to you and you can import rather than export and then you can see uh, subtitles created in other uh, platforms or with other uh, software. The other things that you can also do and that's the one that I will uh, I was recommending uh, is if I go out from here I can work with Translate Pro and then the Translate Pro is what everybody's using now for uh, testing students or testing new subtitlers. So it looks slightly different. So I've created here one that I'm calling uh, Ukraine. Okay. And what I've got here is a video uh, that I've, I've created for my students. And I like this video because it's complicated. And uh, I'm going to open my video here. It's the beginning of Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, uh, let me see on my desktop, Ukraine and cartoon, this one. Okay. I don't know. It's probably because I have them open before. New project. Uh, now. Okay, so I'm creating this one here. So I'm going to, uh, sorry, not that. So I'm going to get, I've got my video, which I have created here. Uh, so I'm going to open my video, which is a very, is a challenging one. I can send you the material you want to work with your students. And um, one easy way of dealing with my uh, subtitles, for instance, I've got them here is cartoon. Sorry, not Granada. It's Ukraine. So it's cartoon. So these are the subtitles uh, here, which are in SRT. I can just drag them here. Yeah, simply dragging, even though it's on the cloud. And I say import. Okay, and then you've got here, I've got my video and my subtitles that I've given them. If you can see now, if I want to write here, I cannot do anything. The system won't allow me to. This is the original. They've got the information and I want them to translate. And you can see here, uh, for instance, this subtitle is complicated. Yeah, so you've got here, for instance, uh, the play on works. Uh, excuse me, uh, no. Uh, uh, 
you know, the police, civil authorities, ASPCAC, ASAP, they have to play with that and find the references. How can you recreate a play on words? Murder, betrayal, kidnap, no, birdnap. So how do you translate that? So in here, what I'm interested in is not the technical dimension. That's why they cannot change anything here, but they can translate. And then they're going to translate this and then they say police and then say policia and they forget the I or whatever. And then they're going to do uh, I don't know how to translate uh, because it's a uh, very challenging or whatever. So they can already know, you know, they can see here it's too long. They will have to decide, okay, they're going to come down there. That is a mistake there or no. The reading spin is too high. They'll have to play with their translation and so on. So in here, what I want them to play with is the linguistic dimension. And I don't need to worry too much. I give them this and then they will be able to monitor. Okay, this is wrong because it's too long. So how do you uh, condense your information and do it in a way that you can play with it? So I play with them. I say, okay, this one you do 15 characters per second or you can do, okay, do 17 or do 16 or whatever. So you change a little bit the parameters so that the uh, exercise becomes more or less complicated. Yeah, and more or less difficult. Now, this I've prepared myself, and this is what you are going to find as well in that book, in the website, lots of material. The subtitles are already done. So if they open temp uh, the translate, then they can start translate, and then they can do it, and then they can send you the file, and then you can see, and see if the translation is good or not, or they can show to the rest of the students, and then you can all share it, and then see if they did it well or not. The beauty of the translation, but it's not, done or whatever. So this is a very, very simple way of working, not too onerous because the technical dimension is being done, but it's still simulating the platform that Netflix will use or Plint will use and with the same functionality, knowing that your subtitles are too long, too short, the lines, the reading speed and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, everything is contemplated in there. So another thing that I wanted to show you here, okay. I'm going to close that because I don't see, I've got too many windows open and then sometimes it's problematic. Um, I, I want to now leave, I'm going to create one, a new, and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving now uh, students to be free, yeah, to do whatever they want and work on whatever they want to do. And I'm going to call it uh, Freedom uh, as my project. And I want to say, okay, fine, I want the students. Um, I'm not very good at finding videos and I don't know. And what I've done now, I said, uh, I'll show you now, and I've got it here. I just discovered today and I wanted something a bit more dynamic here. So, done safe. So if I come here and then I tell my students, okay, uh, we're gonna be working, we're gonna create subtitles you can create. So you can go to your media and then for your video, I will just go to load the URL. So anything, as Lesia was asking, anything that is on YouTube, I can use to subtitle. So that opens up anything for your students. So I've chosen something today. So I'm going to load my video. And here you have, I'm not sure if you know this one. Of course we know. I liked it. I, I only discovered it today. found something in Ukrainian, but anything that is on YouTube, you can use. The only shortcoming here is that uh, down here, I don't see the sound wave or the shortcuts. Yeah, because it's working through another platform and makes it challenging. Uh, but if you want with the students, I can still go, if I go back with my video player, With my five and four, I can go with four. Yeah, and I can go back and I can see here and then decide what I'm gonna stop and when I'm gonna start doing my subtitle. So what I'm going to do, this is for my subtitle. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, and I want to respect that short change there. That's gonna be the end of my subtitle. I'm gonna do my subtitle, which is not quite what she's saying. I understand that. I'm going to do another subtitle. And if I go now to here. 
<laughs> so this in 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 the sense of you know getting material you could ask at the beginning your students okay why which any video you want produce the subtitles they can send you the template and then you can use that for future generations of students for material that you want you don't need to worry about downloading making it in a format that is going to be readable or anything but it just uh, available there. And you can see as well for companies, the beauty of this is that they don't need to send you anything either. They only send you an URL or you are working on the platform so you don't download. And then there is no risk of pirating the information, people sending their subtitles, uh, their videos appearing somewhere, uh, pirated and so on. And particularly when they're always so zealous uh, about the, the material that they are producing and, and the, the marketing of their new campaigns uh, in subtitling. Yeah, so that is uh, another way that you can exploit uh, when you are working with this. And then the other thing that I also wanted to show, uh, you can do, for instance, your subtitle, your translators have been, I'm going to produce a new one. Uh, uh, I'm going to call it whichever. So this one here, review, uh, if you want your students to work together to each other and, and then, um, you know, make sure that they understand uh, the, uh, the translation that other people have done, they provide feedback and they can work as if they were revisers. So in here, what I can do is import my file, uh, which I've got here, it was the, um, encounter so I can get my subtitles here I will import and then what you can see here I've got the same file twice this one is what the translator has done okay and I cannot do anything again this is blocked for me I cannot write anything I cannot do anything but if I am revising the work of another student or my students, I said, look, who are you? I said, but look, you don't really need this in here <coughs> because it's not really appropriate. And I can write a remark here, um, not need it, yeah? Uh, because it's too long or here I know there is a problem, 22 characters per second. I only need 15, yeah, yeah. Well, then I said, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll delete it uh, and I can write a comment here, uh, too fast. Uh, it was here, so it's too fast in the translation or whatever, I can give all those comments. So what I can see here now, if I send this file to the, the student, then the student can see, see the differences and then they can see the first one, look what, they've deleted that, the red. And I can see now the difference there. They've deleted, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah? If I wanted to change here, uh, what then, and then is wrong, and then this should be an A or whatever in there, you can see that they're gonna see the red here and the green there, and all the changes that are taking place, they are there, yeah? And then they can go. So it's a good way of giving them really uh, specific feedback or them being trained on how to provide feedback to other students and changing things and so on. So you are moving the tasks to the students and then it's not just you commenting on all these students, but also I usually break my students in pairs. I say, okay, you exchange and then you see how you provide feedback, be, be sure that you are constructive and not destructive and, and that you can provide meaningful information and so on. And then see whether you agree or disagree and blah, blah, blah. So it's another activity that you can do with that. And then the last thing that I wanted to show you with this is something that you cannot do uh, right now with any subtitling program, which is burn burn and encode. Basically what I can do here is that I can get my subtitles so I can import my subtitles here so if I was a student and then this is gonna be uh, the file for uh, this one. I'll import here. Yeah, and then uh, it's gonna generate a preview, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is get my video which is uh, from desktop here is Ukraine and it's encounter and it's this one. And what I'm gonna do now is create one video with everything there. 
So it's all finished. If you don't like it here and you like it a bit bigger, I can say, well, okay, subtitles here, font size 18. I'm gonna do 30 as I told you, uh, which is the standard. Yeah, and now I'm going to go and burn my subtitles because it's very, very short. You can see that it's gonna go pretty fast. And what it's gonna do is now one only document that contains the subtitles. So anytime I open that with a video player, it's gonna be playing my translation, my subtitles that I can share with my students, with my friends or whatever. It goes, it, it saves it in my computer, whatever I got the video in my directory. Uh, here, remember I created the Ukraine in my desktop, Ukraine, this is the video. And now it's an MP4 that when I open it, well, who are you? He I just has you, the subtitles that I've done. Yeah, yeah, I know, you told me that. Yeah. What else are you? What are you? Yeah, and if I go with my you video to the end there, no and then I've got license. all my things. No 4F card, no insurance policy. So that means that they've got now a PDF that they could put on their Facebook or on their Twitter or whatever, and you will have always the subtitles embedded. And it gives that idea that is a final product. You know that anybody now can see their translation and they can share it with their friends or with the people that they want to, rather than as we end up usually, which is a video that has got nothing and then a file con containing subtitles. Yeah, so the burning, which is the final dimension is very difficult to simulate in class, but now it's become very, very easy with uh, um, uh, an application like this, that is straight away, you bring your subtitles, you bring the video, that's it, the final uh, production. Okay, so that's all you things that you could do. There are activities that you could be asking uh, your subtitles to produce. <clears throat> um, let me see, uh, I'm giving you here uh, examples of testing. This is one company, I cannot tell you which one it is, but this is what they are sending to potential students, yeah, or potential translators, subtitlers. So you've got here uh, four parts. The first part, here what they have to do. Then you've got this one here, translate. They are like dialogue, which is what you most likely expect on any videos, dialogue. Then you've got here uh, condensation. In one line, no more than 38 characters that you need to translate. And then you've got more subtitles. Then you've got here, translate. This is like a subtitle. You've got there, time in, time out, duration, uh, how long is on the screen. And then the final test, which is the most difficult, I tell you time in, time out, but I don't tell you how long is on the screen. And then you should know. This is a bit old, in my opinion. I don't like these tests because you cannot see the videos. They tell you this is an interview, is this, is that, but you don't see who is talking, which is crazy if you ask me. But some companies don't have platforms uh, or they don't want to share it with uh, potential uh, workers. And then they still will send, the, will send you this material. What is happening now, uh, since Hermes, uh, which was the uh, testing that, Netflix launched a few years back, people are following the suit of, of uh, Netflix and they are um, testing students or testing people on their platform. And then you get here, all the testing is done in the platform is five uh, phases and you can read them in detail. And this is what they were doing. The first one, there is something in English and they want to know if you are familiar with jargon, with colloquialisms in English, what is another expression to put up a fight? How can you say that? And then they give you five, choose one. Or uh, in here more with translation, I give you the English, I've given you uh, the translation in Italian, although they also worked in Ukrainian, the test was also in Ukrainian, and then I give you the here, five solutions, choose one, uh, and then you've got here, uh, this one is uh, listening comprehension, you're listening something in English, and I'm giving you a solution in Italian, choose which one it is, so you're listening in English, but you already need to make a decision in your target language, or I show you a video, and it contains a subtitle and you have to tell me, is the subtitle correct? Is incorrect? How is incorrect? 
yeah, and I give you a little bit of time. So these are the activities that you could also do in your class with your students to make to make sure uh, that they fully understand how it's done. And then you will be now what you find is the platforms that I showed you earlier on, where they will be like Translate Pro. Uh, they will get the video, they will get the test in English, and then they have to translate. Yeah, and they Perhaps, will. Be, may I uh, ask you? Time. Yes. Uh, don't you find a little bit strange this uh, task where um, the candidate should choose uh, some uh, correct uh, translation for jargon? I think uh, if you don't know it, you just can look in a dictionary. It's not a problem. And uh, for me, it, it's a little bit strange because it's abstract knowledge. It's not your functional uh, skills or something like that. Yeah, uh, it, there was a lot of, of uh, discussion there. For Netflix, the most important thing at this beginning was we need people that understand English. And this is a sine qua non. This is, this is something that we expect. And, and you'll be surprised how many people think that they know English and they don't know. What they wanted to as well was to do something that you can somehow automatically disregard the people that are not good. And it was a good way with multiple choice to get rid of people. And the way they did it was there were three that were done uh, automated, but also in a particular period of time. So you only had about 10 minutes or less to, re to reply. So yes, you could go and search for the information, but by the time you found some, the time was gone and you didn't finish, and then you will, but you wouldn't get the, the 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 results that you were expecting to. But that was a way of how can you test at a very large scale. And when we are talking about large scale, there were more than half a million who did the test, uh, which that taught us many problems as well. Probably shouldn't have been free. Maybe you should do it in a different way and blah blah. But that is the amount of people applying and then they have to be to look for ways of getting rid of that so that was one way of saying okay how can we get rid of the people that think they know but in reality they don't know and then after that there were two tests which were very complicated videos about 40 to 50 subtitles in about 40 minutes uh, each of them to translate. And they were challenging. They were really uh, quickly spoken, uh, many people, very dense, so that you needed to condense and so on. And those ones, they say, okay, these ones, we will have people checking them, but we don't want to do this at the beginning, that many people will do it just to see how it goes, and they don't even know English. But yes, this is one thing. Many companies will still do that. They will still be testing English because they think people think sometimes more than they actually no, in reality. Mm -hmm. Jorge, they yeah. say that Netflix is one of the toughest uh, test givers. Is that true? Um, I'm not really sure. I hope that it was challenging because I was behind the, crea the creation of that test. <laughs> so yeah. we did it uh, through my university <laughs> and we wanted something. It was the first time that we were doing something like that. And, and it was a bit of a challenge working with Netflix from that perspective, 32 languages, some languages I don't understand, Ukrainian, I don't know anything, Vietnamese, I, 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 even less. Uh, but we we were trying and, and, and people received it well. Uh, there were issues because it was, you know, more than half a million people uh, did it and, and that brings in lots of logistically uh, logistical uh, problems and, and not being able to check everybody that did it uh, at, at the right time and so on. Uh, but many people consider that the tasks were relevant. And, and I know that some of the companies are now following suit and copying or simulating similar tasks uh, when they are um, getting new, new, new people. Aren't you breaking any NDAs? now sharing this information sorry uh, are you not breaking any non-disclosure agreements when you're sharing not this now not now but i couldn't we did it in this in in 2017 i think and i couldn't say anything for several years so it was non-disclosure okay. and i couldn't tell anyone and nobody working in the project could say anything uh but after that they told me okay now you can uh, because okay. it's part of my research. And now I can claim that I was involved. But for many years, I didn't say anything. I could say, well, I know that, you know, I, I've heard and blah, blah, but I couldn't say it was me. Okay, great. Yeah. But now it is, it's, it's changed a little bit. 
in there. Uh, you've got here as well, I give you more information uh, for you to know. Uh, there are associations that you might be uh, willing to follow. There is the AVT Europe, which is an association of audiovisual translators in Europe. And they are expanding to many places. If you were ever to think about an association for Ukrainian subtitlers or audiovisual translators, they will be willing to help you to do things together and, and so on. Now we're finding many associations in different countries uh, with information on, on how on, on the industry, on payment and so on. So I will suggest that you follow them up as well. And um, there is a very new one, which is called Entertainment Globalization Association, created less than a month ago and is developing quite fast. They've got an area that is being called education that you might want to take a look and follow. And then they've got the, their members, they're all companies working in translating audiovisual programs. And uh, is a good starting point for your students as well to know who, which companies are working in this field, which companies are dealing with uh, dubbing, subtitling, uh, captioning, uh, audio description in different languages. You've got nearly 100 companies listed here, all of them doing nothing but audiovisual translation. And that's again a good reference point for your students. And then they also got jobs advertised there when they're looking for uh, experience or people with experience in audiovisual or knowledge in audiovisual. So I give that to you as a reference if you want to take a look there. And I myself keep on board and keep abreast of changes because it's very, very difficult. But there are two main bodies, observatories, in uh, that take a look at audiovisual media, media in general, translation in general on audiovisual a lot of times, which are Slater and Nimzi. Uh, it's good for any translation, not just audiovisual, but they keep, they, they search the internet and they can send you, I am subscribed for a, a weekly uh, digest. So I get, it's, it's free. You don't have to pay. So they send me a digest and I get information on any publications that are new. And some of them are interesting and refer to audiovisual or terminology or cut tools or whatever. I choose which ones I read in more detail. But this is a way for me to keep uh, alert of what things are changing in the industry because it's changing so fast that I find it very, very challenging um, sometimes in there. Yep. I promise to you um, that we will have questions and answers. And I'm very, very happy uh, for anyone. We've, I've been resolving some during these sessions, but if you need anything else, we have at least three minutes. Uh, I'm quite happy to stay a bit longer. If anybody wants to stay longer, I, I'm, I don't have an excuse that I have to run and catch the underground or anything. I am at home. So more than happy to spend 10 more minutes or 15 in need be to address those questions. If you have questions so, in the chat, you can either choose it yourself or Vima can do it for you, whatever you prefer. Okay, what I'm going to do, this PowerPoint I'm sending. I haven't sent it yet, but I'm going to PDF it and send it to the organizers. So it will be coming um, your way. And then I'll stop sharing now that I can see better uh, and more things here. And, and we can have more, I can have more vision of the people here. So uh, I've got one question, uh, lots of them in here. I'm not sure where to start. Uh, in Ukraine, the rates for AVT are quite low. Have you noticed this trend in Britain? What do you think is the reason for that? Is Katerina uh, Bodarenko. And uh, there has been a trend and there used to be a trend to uh, lowering rates. And that was very problematic in the industry. And I think that's one of the reasons why many subtitlers has, have started to um, um, unionize somehow to get in, in associations and working towards better uh, deals in, in this field. My feeling now is that it's changing for the better. Uh, Netflix, for instance, uh, when they did their testing, they were aware that people weren't, weren't uh, being paid enough, and they did the test as, an op as, a, as, a, as a possibility, as a way for the best translators to be able to charge more money. And they made the pay rates available everywhere. So it was online, and you could see the rates. I've got the rates, I can send them to you. 
<coughs> the list, uh, starting from about uh, 12, 10, 12 um, uh, dollars per minute. Yeah, and it, it, there are various ways of paying, but usually they will pay you per minute of program, which can be a little bit uh, unfair. If they are talking a lot, that is not much. If they are very silent and then they go and go in the landscape and, and you can enjoy the, uh, you know, the sunrise, then it's ideal, you know let's hope that the sunrise will last forever and then you get paid every minute that the sun is rising but if it's a Woody Allen talking like non-stop is a very is a very challenge uh, ordeal in dealing with that so you get paid per minute and as I said some companies um, uh, you know Netflix made it uh, freely available what they pay and now they're asking the people working for them to pay a certain minimum uh, of that. And we're seeing now the increase on some of them. The idea and the way that Netflix did it was, okay, once you do the test with us, it, we will give you a number. And we know which people are good because they've done a good test here. And then what they are doing now is with the companies, they're telling them, okay, we've got the crown. And the crown is one of our best TV shows. We don't want you to give it to anybody. So we want you to give it to anybody that has got a Hermes number or a Hermes result, which is above X. And then the companies go to people and say, well, listen, we need to work for this, for Netflix. They need to be really, you know, we would like to work with you because you've got a high number. Then you can say, how much do you pay me? And if they pay you two, you say, well, sorry, but I have to be busy. I don't do it for less than five. And the company knows that they cannot do it with anyone because they will have to tell to Netflix who's done it. And, and that's where you, as a translator, can negotiate a bit more than before. Before they told you, we pay you three, no negotiation. Now they can tell you, we pay you three, but you can say, well, no, I don't do it. And they probably cannot afford not to do it with you because Netflix is going to be asking them who has done it. We don't want bad quality and you have to tell me. And that's why we mentioned at the beginning as well, this idea that subtitles give their name, put their names in their translations so that people know and then they know who has been doing it and, and you can follow that. Uh, but Netflix was complaining that they don't know. They pass it on to another company and then the company pays whatever they want, work with people that probably are not good enough. And that's why they're trying to keep an eye on that. So it's changing a little bit. But uh, yes, what you were saying, it was for a period, it was a bit challenging and still, you know, as in any um, blue collar professions, you know, the competition can be harsh and people, you know, they will try to pay less and you will try to earn more. I know this from writers, from photographers and all these liberal arts. Yeah. What new developments am I interested in? In. Do you have any suggestions for manuals in French and Spanish? Uh, Tetiana Kachavnovska, and I do, uh, but I didn't uh, think that there will be uh, people interested, and that's why my list of references doesn't incorporate. But if you want, Tetiana, do send me an email, and I will send you uh, references. I've got one of my books was written in Spanish a while ago, and, and there are books uh, like uh, this one here, uh, I think you can see, which is in French and is by um, somebody from France, uh, Jean-François Cornu, and is both dubbing and subtitling. Um, I've got in other languages, in Chinese as well, and in Malay, uh, they've been written books. I don't understand what they say, uh, but I, I, I like having books like this. Mm -hmm. and, and I have in many languages. In Italian, there is a lot of work as well. So please feel free and say, Jorge, remember, uh, I ask you about this. Can you send me because I teach Spanish or I teach French or I teach um, Italian or I teach whatever. And I'll send you more detailed information, no worries. Yeah. Uh, what new developments I, uh, are you more enthusiastic? I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I'm enthusiastic, how I'm hard to understand enthusiastic because sometimes I feel so much, you know, how, how can you, how can anyone uh, follow this up? Um, I follow with interest and I'm not sure how much enthusiasm, for instance, uh, cat tools and machine translation applied to audiovisual. Uh, this is something that we always felt this is never going to happen. Who in their right mind are going to translate Woody Allen with a machine translation? 
<laughs> it's crazy. It's stupid. Doesn't make sense. But what we are finding now is that you've got our uh, Vikings. This TV series that I'm sort of uh, I'm watching a little bit now in Amazon, which is I don't know how many episodes. It's hundreds of episodes. No, yeah, it is a lot and lot of episodes. You've got Latin American soap operas that they last forever and ever and ever. They've got hundreds of episodes. So machine translation might not be good for just translating as such machine translation, but it could be good for you for, for to remind you certain expressions that somebody always says in Spanish and you want to repeat in Ukrainian and say, okay, this one, I don't remember what it was, or this is something that I trans I've translated before, but I don't remember. And rather than you being fishing in all your documents, it could be in the machine there, in the uh, platform, and I can give you ideas on, on how to translate again. So more like a memory rather than a machine translation. Although now we find in these hybrids that are because they're statistical and they just work on translation that you've done, that can help you deal with that. So I find that I follow it with interest. I'm not sure, and there is the risk. You don't want to be um, um, post-editing all the time. And particularly if the post-editing is boring and is badly made, then the, 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 the output from the machine translation, then it becomes a nightmare rather than enjoyable. But Looking at the potential, I know that is needed, and I, I understand why some companies. I was reading, uh, you know, looking about things, just to give you a very little idea. But every minute of our lives, every minute that I've been speaking now, more than three hundred hours of video is uploaded to YouTube. That's only YouTube. That doesn't even consider Bilibili, which is the largest in the world in China. It doesn't consider uh, Vivo. It doesn't consider all these platforms around where people can upload videos. But it is that everybody is dealing with videos. And companies say, you know, we don't have enough. You know, we don't have enough people. We, we have too many, too much material, too many videos. And, and even if everybody was a subtitler, we couldn't subtitle everything that is out, out there. So that's why Google, YouTube, um, the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Yale University, Columbia University, these are big players in academia, in research. They've been dealing with machine translation in subtitling since the 2000s. 2004, Google already and YouTube started with automated machine translation, machine tra uh, subtitles. Um, so I can see their interest. I can see why they're looking at that, but I think it's still a long way to go. And I think it should be with translators involved. And that is something that sometimes is forgotten. Um, I'll tell you a large corporation, they asked about subtitles, what would you like in our platform? And you know what subtitles were asking for? A spell checker, a bloody spell checker. They've been around for donkeys. But in this case, the developers, they didn't think about adding a spell checker because they are developers. They're not linguists. They're not translators. So they created all these platforms, a beautiful platform that you could do all these things and they forgot to have a spell checker. And then the translator was asking, about, can you please add a spell checker? So, oh, yes, we'll do that. It shouldn't be too complicated. But they're not thinking because we're not part of that discussion. And that's what I think we should be more in there. Uh, look, we have uh, report it directly, for example, to Grammarly and uh, ask them to develop some tool exactly for uh, cut tools for audiovisual translators because they uh, work on spell checking and yep. grammar checking. <laughs> yeah, 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 but now, for instance, Una, the spell checker is not really good sometimes with certain languages. Some languages are okay, but some others are not. And, and what I ask my students is, okay, export. Uh, and then you can export like a, a RTF, which is like a Word document. And then you can use this spell checker on, in Word, which is very good. What is better than the one in Una? But we're still struggling. Those are the shortcomings that we find that technology seems amazing. The things that we can do, it really is uh, unbelievable, the potential. But because we don't get somehow engaged or because they don't ask us, then we're not really making the most of it. And that's why I like now working with these companies and trying to make things a bit more helping us in the way we're doing things. One of the things, for instance, uh, in all these platforms that I was showing you, uh, when I come into the platform, into Una, what I can do, 
and imagine I am a work uh, um, a project manager, I can say, okay, I've got this, uh, I'm translating Vikings. I've sent the latest episode to Lesia. She's translating into Spanish. And Lesia, I need it for Monday. This is Saturday and I can do two things. I can send an email to Lesia and say, Lesia, would it be ready for Monday? And then Lesia might say, oh dear, I haven't done it. I went out partying, uh, I, I don't do this, blah, blah. But oh yeah, Jorge, I'll do it. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. But I'm worrying because she hasn't sent me anything and I don't know anything. So I have to trust her that she's gonna deliver. Second thing I can do is I can go on the platform and become Lesia and then see exactly where Lesia is in that film. And then I can see, oh dear, she's only do two subtitles. And she's telling me by email that she's nearly finished. She's only do two subtitles. And I can say, Lesia, no, sorry, you've only done two. You're not gonna finish. I'm gonna ask Tatiana to do half. So concentrate on half. Tatiana, please go here and do the other half. And I can monitor what everybody else. I know that in these Vikings, they're using the term fucking three times. That's gonna be an issue in the subtitles. And I can go and see whether you've translated, how you've translated it, or the reviewer can already, while you're still working, they can see the work you've done. So as a project manager, I can see everything. I can ask the, the client, listen, do you want to see? You know, they're working well. Your video is nearly finished. Take a look. It's already there. And then they can see even before Lesia has finished. They can see work in progress, whereas now they cannot. Now, Lesia has got a play on words. Yeah, and she, last night she went partying. Um, she's no, no oh, she's, no. she's a, <laughs> She's struggling and she's thinking, oh God, this play on words. I don't know how to do this in Spanish. It's very funny, but I cannot find anything in Ukrainian. I think, God, I don't know how to do it. It's very complicated, blah, blah, blah. And then she's doing blah, blah. What she could also do, but now she cannot, is that, okay, I speak English. Let's see if uh, Mark didn't go partying last night and he's clever in his translation. And you can go and say, okay, I'm gonna see what Mark has done. And then you can see that Mark has translated into English and it's very funny. It's, oh, that in English is really funny. I could do that in uh, Ukrainian because it's, it's a funny play on words and that will work in Ukrainian. Or you can go and check the work that has been done in Croatian if you speak Croatian or in Italian or in another language. And you will be working like we are now in a sort of um, virtual office. I can ask uh, Katerina, oh, Katerina, can you tell me what this means in Ukrainian? I'm stuck here and how do you do that? And in within the same platform, we could be helping each other. But no, they haven't done that. They've only done it for the benefit of the company, for the benefit of the uh, project manager that can have an overview, but you continue to be isolated, I'm working in your little parcel, I'm going out sending emails to everybody or ringing people, listen, how do you do this? Oh, how do you do that? But as you could just go into the platform, see whatever somebody else has done and then just do the work there. Yeah. Or if you're working in groups, you could just be working in the same film and then you can see what everybody else is doing and blah, blah. So there are uh, there is a lot of potential, but it hasn't been tapped in. And that's what I would like to, to, that this technology is done from the perspective of the translators as well, which right now seems to me there is not. And ideally also from the perspective of the teachers, uh, because I am, after all, most of my work is done in, in education and sometimes the platforms are not ideal to teach in. You know, I don't want to be downloading the material and sending it to my students. It defeats the purpose. I would like to do it leave it on the platform and then the students can go and find it, the material. But right now they cannot because when you enter, you enter in your own bubble and your students cannot come in your bubble unless you've got like me, the rights to go into your students and you can see, but your students cannot. Or you don't have a shared area in the platform but you could put all your uh, activities. Now I have to send you the video one way, the subtitles in another way. So that's what I would like as well, to make it in a different way so that it's easier for us as well to teach and, and, and for translators to work in here. So those are areas that I am very interested in and, and that I am following um, quite a lot. 
Jorge, it's very interesting. I think maybe it could be like that, that open source resources, they sh uh, could uh, like cover this perspective of translator because I personally work with Omega Day. It's also open source tool just for, for written <laughs> translation. Uh -huh. And I, I have noticed that uh, it's much more friendly exactly to translator uh, and also working in team uh, than commercial tools because you really can and share your comments with everybody in your project. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm pushing really much and I might come your way for more information on that because that's what I think, you know, we've got all the technologies there, it's just the use we make of it. And, and I think for some companies now, the problem is that they think if you are so connected, you're going to be starting, you, start, you will start uh, comparing salaries or rates, how much do you get paid, and you and the other, and we all know that, you know, the union uh, united with the stronger. Uh, and, and then, of course, for some clients, that might not be the right thing. So if you are isolated, they can pay you less, and you don't know, and, and blah, blah, blah. So I can understand sometimes that sort of feeling that you don't want to get everybody together in there um, and I can feel, I can sense why that is, but it still is not excuse that the technology is not being maximized for the benefit of the translators. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what we need to, to be doing more. Yeah. There is another area that I, I, I'm trying to look into, uh, particularly I've got colleagues working a lot on um, um, uh, crisis translation and something happens, an earthquake happens or now the pandemic and everything starts in China and if you don't understand Chinese and then you need to translate quickly. And we know that now people are communicating a lot more through visual communication and most of the um, charities or NGOs um, working in crisis, they don't have anything. You know, I did a little project with Translators Without Borders. Uh, they don't have, they don't know how to do subtitles, subtitles. they don't know how to uh, work their flows and so on. And, and, and there is as well this idea that subtitles uh, come quickly. But in some of these situations of crisis, I think, you know, in languages like in Rohingya, uh, where you find probably people in Burma that were uh, displaced and then they were going to other countries and so on, I, I, I would imagine that many of them will find it difficult to learn, to read their own languages, the languages that they're speaking uh, on a day to day. And I wonder, could we do something with speech recognition? Can we do more voiceover? Can we Automate, automatize voiceover? Can we use synthetic voices for languages that are about to disappear that we could create something that once there is a big uh, emergency, an earthquake or, uh, 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 you know, or a pandemic or Ebola uh, or whatever, can we get it quick with videos, with information to people and so on. And this is an area, and I know nothing has been done really. People are, when they talk about crisis translation, it's always written text or messages to your mobile, but this is always written text. And um, for some people, they might not be able to read it because they are, they are languages that are spoken in Africa that they, they not really, they don't have a written form. And even when they do, some people are illiterate in their language because they are not familiar with that. They only use it for, um, um, communication for daily communication. So that's another area that I think the technology and audiovisual translation could be helpful. And, and this is something that interests me um, as well. Jorge, may I ask you also one uh, practical question? You mentioned yeah. that you have a course of 10 weeks as a rule, yeah? yeah. But how many hours? Uh, because we just start developing such courses and maybe we can also influence this volume of the courses. Yes. How would uh, you recommend? Which and you, re you remind me as well that I didn't touch on the assessment. There is a, a slide that is about assessment. Yeah, in the UK usually it's 10 hours and usually two hours per week. It's not much. It comes up to 20, some places they may have three. So you're looking at a module on subtitling, which is 20 hours, or a module which is probably 30 hours. That's virtually all throughout the UK. I know in the UK, we tend to be slightly different to Europe because we bank a lot more on uh, work done outside of the classroom. 
whereas European countries, they, they count a lot more on presence in the classroom. So there's a lot more of uh, students having to go to the classroom and spending hours there. So uh, for some of our students in the UK, <clears throat> they will come to class 12 hours, 14 hours a week. That's as much as they've got face to face. Whereas in Europe, sometimes it's 20 something hours. Yeah, so it's much more contact. So in, in here, that's what we do is two hours per week, three hours per week mm. during uh, three months, which comes up to 20, 30 hours maximum. That's as much as we cover. Yeah. And then for examining that, you could do, uh, it depends, you know, either a test or I do what I call a test or an exam or a project. And that depends on how you want to allow your students to, to behave. You know, a test to a large extent allows you to control who is doing what. You know, if they're doing a project and they're doing it over a couple of weeks, if they are good students, maybe they've done it, but maybe they did it with the help of their friends or their brother-in-law or their grandfather or whatever. And you, you never know. We try to both to do both. The idea of a project is that it allows you to choose what you want to do. And the students love it because they can choose the video that they, they wanted to do and the TV series or whatever. And, and that element of engagement is really strong for the students. And they do learn when they're working with things that they want to do. Uh, so I try to do say, okay, fine, you can do a project, but also a test and, and do that. If you're doing a project, I don't think it's wise to work on how long is the video and say, okay, you do 20 minutes or five minutes because it really depends on how much are they talking. So what I go about is I tell my students, okay, you do a project, maximum 75 to 80 subtitles. And then you choose the video. But I go for subtitles because, you know, five minutes of Woody Allen will come up with a hundred subtitles of Svartzenager is probably five or 10. So I, I prefer to do subtitles. And I know one of my problems with my subtitles with my students is that they do too much. I tell them do 75 and they all, oh, I was carried away after 120. Well, tough luck. I'm only correcting 75 mm -hmm. because I've got 60 students, 125 per student. I'll, I'll end up my life just correcting. So I think with 75 or so is enough to know if they are okay in their translation, if they know the technical side, if they know uh, the translation, if they play well with place on words and so on. What I did at the beginning, I allow students to choose anything they wanted. And I, that allowed me many years ago to build up lots of material. And then I used those for my teaching in following years. I said, okay, this video is really good. It, lots of uh, humor or swearing or whatever. And then their work I use for my teaching. Then it becomes a little bit challenging because if they all, if you've got many students and they all work in different things, your marking takes longer. Yeah, you end up with material for teaching, but it takes longer. Then sometimes when I say, okay, I give them three or five and I say, okay, choose from among this. So that's freedom and they do it. If not, what I also do like is a test. And then for a test, I mean, I give them a video with the subtitles that I have already chosen. And I want to see how they do the translation. So I do the test and the project. So in the test, I only take a look at the technical, at the linguistic dimension. I give them some, something challenging and I do three hours maximum, 50 to 60 subtitles. No more than that. That's enough. One, two students finish earlier, but no many more finish earlier than that. And everybody stays till the end of the test. So three hours, 50 to 60 subtitles, you find something that is a bit challenging and so on. It's fine, it works okay. Students are not too stressed out and then they can work nicely in, in their translation. And that's what I do as well. How much technical are you when you are checking? Uh, do you check with your heart or with some very cre precise criteria? That this for, for my test, uh, because I give them the, the technical dimension, I only pay attention to the linguistics uh -huh. and make sure that they haven't written too much and things like that. But the technical dimension I've done. When I give them a project, then I do take it the, um, 
uh, the technical dimension. I'll tell them, okay, make sure that you don't go over short changes. So I take a look at short changes when I'm doing that. I take a look what we do with Lesia and the encounter. I take a look this this updates about these two probably better if they're together than separated because it's too much here or too much there. So I look at how they have put the subtitles together and tell them, okay, too, you've got too many or you've got too little. This one is more than six seconds. This one is too short, it's less than one second. So I do take a look at the technical dimension. Something that I've done this year new is because we have to move to remote. And when I do a test, I like a test because I've got them all in my classroom and it has to be them. It's nobody else doing the translation. So I know that, you know, I can, I can then write a reference letter and say, yes, this is a student. I know he's done a good translation because it was in front of me. Otherwise, I have to bank on, on them doing their work and not with friends. But this year, because of the situation and I cannot go to my lab, uh, what I've done is something new. So I've, I've, the, I've done the same. I've chosen myself the video and, and I've told them, okay, here you have the video. You have to do everything and you've got 24 hours, no more. And I've given them a video, which is, uh, what I told them is a video, do 50 subtitles and stop once you've reached 50. Yeah, no more than that. So allow the video to continue. If it continues, don't worry. But I want you to do 50 or 60 and you've got 24 hours. Yeah, so see how you do it. And it's worked okay. I didn't have any problems with the students. All of them worked. And none of them said it was too much. Uh, because, of course, it's one day, but it's during the course. So they have other modules and they have other things. I alert them. I'm going to release on Wednesday to Thursday. So I make sure that that Wednesday you don't have too many things. But, of course, irremediably, people have other things on a, on a day. Um, so banking on that and that they might have other things to do and so on, it was okay. <clears throat> that was the first time. That I've done it. I've, I had never done it that way, but it, it worked okay. Otherwise, I would always recommend go per subtitle, not per minute. And um, and yes, you can do. You know, if you've got the luxury of time with your students, and if you don't have too too many. Although my feeling is that sometimes when I've done this with with teachers in Brazil, for instance, or in Spain, the problem is that they have got too many students. Is one of the popular modules, and then they receive many students. So you have to be careful because marking this, trans, marking translation is challenging in general. But this one with the technical dimension, it can take you a long time. So you don't want to do something that is too unmanageable. Uh, so that's why I'm very strict that I say no more than X subtitles because otherwise, if it was for the students, they would like to do the whole episode. And say, well, no, no, no. You know, I have to be sensible because it's my marking here. So you have to be careful of that. And so, uh, ideally, if you don't have too many students, then a test and a project is ideal. And that's what I've done for many years, mm -hmm. you know, because the project allows them to, you know, enjoy the whole thing and find the material that they want to use and so on. And then the test, you can just focus on the technology, on the linguistics only. That's what I prefer. But I do understand that sometimes it's, um, it's a killer when it comes to marking. And you have to be careful how this is then acknowledged by your university and by the people considering, uh, you know, your marking load and, and so on. But it is, you know, I know, for instance, in universities like Granada, what they do is they put a top and, and they don't allow more than X number of students because they receive in the hundreds and they just don't have enough. So they sometimes say, OK, fine, 50 students only, no more. Uh, and they probably receive 250 requests. So that's the way they manage as well, the number. Yeah. Thank you a lot. And uh, Jorge, I also want to thank you from all the participants. I'm sure that uh, everybody has discovered a lot of interesting advices. And as for me, I especially uh, appreciate this simple scheme which you gave us to produce the subtitle, to take uh, any video, to produce yeah. the subtitles by yourself, yeah. then translate it and embed it um, in, the, in the file. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really very simple and uh, having these tools, you really can yeah. build a course, a maybe simple course, but still you can start with it. Oh, but it is, it, it, it might be simple, in the way it looks and so on, but it's truly professional because that is what the industry is working. And that's what I like is the simplicity without betraying 
what students might be doing in the real life. Um, and you might be doing something very simple, but then they find when they go to a company, it's, well, God, what I've done in my university is good for nothing because it doesn't reflect what people are doing. But this is actually what they are using. This is actually the way it looks. And, and that's the way our companies are developing their different platforms. So that's what I like. That's why I like working with this thing. You know, this is what you're going to find. This is, you know, you, you work, you finish your studies and you, you can swimmingly go into any workflow. Because yes, it might be slightly different the way it looks, but the essence is the same, the way you're going to be doing your subtitles and so on. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you a lot. And thank you, everybody, that you share this evening and this wonderful webinar with us. My pleasure. As I said, I'm quite happy for anything. If you need any more questions, uh, just please do so. I can understand uh, somebody is asking that, Alexander asked something before, but I didn't reply to that. And I didn't see that. You have replied it, no problem. No problem at all. You it's a long a... one, but what is the gist? It was fun subbing. Yes, it was about fun subbing and about uh, whether, um, how to call it, uh, whether there is something useful uh, in what fun subbers are doing uh, that professionals can absorb. Okay, uh, it's a very challenging topic. And when they, when we talk about fun subbing, sometimes they're not amateur translators. Sometimes they are actually professionals and they are people, I have got quite a few uh, colleagues uh, in Spain. They do fun subbing because they are against the political parties. And then they're doing this to distribute. And then for people to know about uh, political uh, members of political parties, and they want to show them in disgrace and how badly they're doing things and blah, blah. So they're doing it with a purpose. Um, and, and it's not just um, anime and things like that. I think there are a few things that we can learn. And creativity probably is one of those that we could be a bit more creative in the way we do subtitling. Um, I'm surprised, for instance, in China, uh, and this links with political um, situations, uh, the government doesn't allow too much importation of foreign programs. So people are using fansubbing in a way to bring in productions, TV series that otherwise wouldn't be watched in China. And that is the way. So there is this way of bypassing certain legislation. But in some ways, it's worked so well that now these fan subbers have become companies and they have evolved because there aren't enough companies in the country to work with audiovisual because in China, they were traditionally, they were appointed by the government to deal with foreign productions. So now that there are more and more programs, there aren't enough people qualified and these fan subbers have become um, professional subtitlers with companies. Uh, and their own platforms, similar platforms. The only thing that they, plat one of the ones that I've seen is only in Chinese. It hasn't been customized in, in English, but that is the way they're doing it. And, and that is um, a way that many Chinese start fan subbing because they know there might be a possibility to become professionals uh, in those environments because it's, it's growing really fast and on the margins of the government. So we still don't know what will happen there, but they are developing in that way. So there are a few things that we can uh, get from there. One other noble uh, approach that I was interesting, and somebody was asking what do you think is interesting, is this idea of pairing up with fan subbers, for instance, or with, um, how was the term that I was reading only yesterday, uh, live streaming sellers. So it's a new trend now to sell things, streaming and live, or explaining what you're doing. In China is the top. And then it will be something like me telling you, well, here you have, this is a book, it's a lovely book. You know, you open by this page and then you're going to find this and blah, blah, blah. And then if you want, I can sell it you and I make it red. And then if, that, and if you buy this, I will also give you this pen because it's going to be blah, blah, blah. And this is becoming more and more popular. And one of the challenges as, is that Chinese are doing it in English because they want to sell abroad, but no more. And their markets in Russia, they say, in Spanish-speaking countries, not enough people. So the idea is, why don't you pair up a translator to produce subtitles 
with a YouTuber or telestreaming or whatever, that they make a lot of money, these influencers, through YouTube. And then you can quantify. You know, you're not a translator. You're not offering your services paid for, but you become a 20% member of that project. So I'm going to translate into Spanish, but all the clicks on the Spanish videos, which is the way you get money, I will get it uh, for me as a translator. So I'm doing it for free to start with, but if this video is successful or your series is successful, then part of that money comes to me, which is the way the YouTubers are doing. And this is what some companies are looking at in China. Is okay, it's a new model. It's not the model, the traditional model is a client. You do the translation, I pay you, bye-bye. This is a bit more risky. You risk it and say, okay, fine. You know, but if you want to open up your market in Ukraine, I am willing to do your subtitles, then see how it goes. But the money you get through this influencing in, in Ukraine, and this is very simple, you can monitor how many clicks and how many people are watched, then I will get X amount. That's your negotiation power, 50%, 80%. You know, and then the same way that the influencer is making money, you could make a bit of money in there. Now we've got a huge scandal in Spain because many of these influencers, they are rich so much so that they live in Spain and going to Andorra so that they don't have to pay taxes in Spain because they say they have to pay too much tax and they've got too many millions. Yeah, and this is all in the news now. If you follow, it was the other day. Uh, with one guy that is is there. So it's a lot of money in there. And right now they only do things in, in their own language. This guy is only Spanish. He's not doing anything in other languages. He's only Spanish and video games. That's what he does. Um, I remember another guy was uh, cars. He just shows cars. You know, he just drives cars and records himself and puts them there. And they've got millions of followers. You know, they, they know, they don't, they banking on, you know, five, six million people following those videos, you know, and I don't know if you know the biggest person on, 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 on this world is not Lady Gaga, is not Madonna, is not anyone, is PewDiePie, which is this Swedish guy that does videos. I've seen one or two videos and I don't think I can watch more because they are, to me, boring beyond belief over a hundred million followers. It's like Netflix. It's like Netflix, one guy doing silly videos. And the only time YouTube canceled the videos, the subtitles, because you can produce subtitles with YouTube. And at one point they, they canceled, they stopped it. It was because this guy, PewDiePie, people were, because it's so popular, people were doing subtitles. And in the subtitles, they were putting publicity and advertising products because they thought, okay, if so many people are watching him, let's put products here and there. And, and then the guy complained and YouTube stopped putting subtitles. So that is the power that you find in some of these places on how people are using this. And, uh, and again, you know, could be a possibility. Some of your students can pair up with some YouTubers and then that could be a little project for the classroom that they do a few and then they just have them on the screen on, on the internet and they can see them. And, Jorge, thank you very much. You have changed our worldview. It will never be the same now. Thank now you. Now you, you will hate me every time you watch subtitles. Oh God, you know, that's wrong. No, that should be that. Oh, that. <laughs> yes, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really something. We feel after these two webinars, like we had the 30 hour course of subtitling and I'm sure it will be very much useful. Dear friends, thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, share the video recording of both webinars, I guess, next week, together with the materials that Jorge will produce.